So I can deposit partial to the bleeding mind. Suppose you can't hold shit. How high I've been. Well, the river don't know it. To climb out and eat a line. To slow the moon roses for a stay.
Call it Castellus. <laughs> Good by starting. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. A warm thanks also to our speakers. And, of course, especially to Joanna Moncrief that came all the way over from London today. It's much appreciated. My name is Einar Plyn. I'm the leader of Stiftelsen Humania. It's a non-profit foundation, or ideal Stiftelse, as we say in Norwegian, that works for a better and more humanistic mental health service in Norway. The topics for today's conference is immensely important. Psychotropic drugs are widely used around the world, especially in the Western developed countries, and, used increase, and use increases by, uh, year by year, also here in Norway. Let me just give two Norwegian examples. The statistics, uh, statistics from Recept Register, also the National Institute of Health here in Norway, shows that 331,000 persons, also unique individuals, 15 years or older were prescribed antidepressants in 2017. Also 15 years and older. That's almost 8% of the population 15 years or older. Of special concern is a substantial increase among the young, especially young girls. The statistics also show that 45,000 were prescribed medication for ADHD in 2017. That's about 1% uh, of the total uh, population, not just the population 15 and older. Of special concern is that almost 12,000 of these 45,000 uh, who got prescribed this medication were 14 years old or younger. At a stage in their lives where their brain is still not fully developed, this means that there is a big medical experience with unknown long-term consequences going on. The background for this widespread medication is the, medica the medical profession's success in defining and classifying more and more of life's challenges, sufferings, pains, that we traditionally in large part have considered that as expressions of normal variation as disease and disorder. Looking closer on these topics, on these topics, I think we have a I very, we have very, a very, very evening interested in store. Evening in today. store. Today. Before I give the uh, before I give the uh, today, uh, the floor to today, today's uh, the floor chair, to today's just chair. a couple of practical things. We are streaming the conference, and videos will shortly be available on the home pages of Stiftels Humania. So. Greetings to all of you that are uh, participating in cyberspace uh, tonight. The filming will only be of the presentations, not the participants. The filming and the uh, uh, streaming is paid by the two user groups, 
WSO and LPP, which is much appreciated. In the break after Joanna Moncrief's presentation, all the particip participants that wants to <laughs> uh, will receive a Norwegian edition of Montgomery's uh, book uh, that has the uh, English title of Straight Talking Introduction to Psychiatric Drugs as a gift from Stiftelsen Humania. I do hope you will take the time and the effort to read it. It's then my pleasure to give the floor to Halvor Kjølstad. He is an experienced psychologist and a member of the board of Stiftelsen Humania. Halvor. Thank you, Einar, and uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, just a few practicalities uh, first. Uh, there will be two breaks. First, a uh, rather short one following uh, Tor Johan Egeland's presentation and uh, a little longer one after uh, Joanne Mongriff's presentation. Uh, we are not uh, inviting you to have a discussion this evening because we have not so much time available and we want, <coughs> we want to get as much as possible out of our presentation presenters. But what we will do is to give, give you in the audience an opportunity to ask, to formulate some questions. So when uh, Joanne Mongriff has uh, done her presentation and there will be a break, you will find these uh, yellow um, pads. pads. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. And pencils. And uh, if you like, you can, uh, you can uh, write a question or two and we will uh, look through the questions and in the discussion towards the end of, of the program we will uh, introduce some of these uh, questions. Okay, so let us get started and I have the pleasure of introducing the first uh, presenter, Tor Johan Ekeland. He is a professor of social psychology at Högskolen i Volda or Molde and he has uh, done extensive research also related to the mental health field and he has a very sharp pen and he also has a quite sharp tongue so now we look forward to hearing you Tor Johan and uh, his uh, title the title of his presentation today is pathologizing of life <coughs> Kjære publikum, dear audience, dear Joanna, we are delighted to have you here, and I myself are honored to on this occasion perform like a warming up speaker for you. But I have to regret them, I'm advised to continue in Norwegian. Pathologisering of life. In 1773 came a young lady riding from a city in Paris with the hope of a job. He got it first after he had written a prize-belønned article. This led him to a job at Bichet, an institution with 4,000 innsatte or patients, criminals, syphilitikers, overgripers and Cirka en 200 av slike vi i dag ville kalt mennesker med psykiske lidelser. På avdelingen St. Pri møtte han en man som skulle få avgjørende betydning for utviklingen hans. Nemlig bestyren av hospitalet, Jean-Baptiste Poussin, som selv hadde pasienterfaring. På denne avdelingen var alt rent og pent. En kvar voldelighet mot patienter var strengt forbudt, så Poussin hadde sagt opp mange pleiere på grunn av dette. Denne legen hette Philip Pinel, senere omtalt som den moderne psykiatriens far. En psykiatri som løsner lenkene og kaster humanismens befriende lys 
over det garnet. Egentlig var det Pusse og hans kone som skal ha mest æren for dette. Og Pinell glemte aldri å anerkjenne Pusse sitt bidrag. Da han flyttet til Salpetrier i 1795, tok han Pusse med seg over dit. I ettertid så har Pinell blitt sett på som hovedeksponenten for en behandlingstilnærming som med det litt misvisende navnet blir kalt moral treatment. Misvisende fordi oversettingen fra fransk like gjerne kunne bety psykologisk. Tilsvarende skjedde i England, kvekerne, Willem Tjuk, ved York Retreat, Gjørgi i Italia, Reel i Tyskland. Hva var dette? Jo, det var en mellommenneskelig, relasjonsorientert og human terapi. En avskaffe alle medisinske tiltak unntatt varme bad. Det går gjerne å forstå. De gale ble behandlet som om de var potensielt vanlige mennesker, altså som subjekt. Galskap ble sett på som tap av fornuftsevne, og målet var å gjenopprette dialogen. Og midlet var i praksis vennlighet, samtaler, rasjonalitet og humanisme, lesnad i bibliotek og kunst i rolige omgivelser. Dette er lenge siden. Svært lenge siden. Hva har psykiatrien etter alle disse årene fått til? Vi fikk den såkalte opptrappingsplanen for psykisk helse i 1999. En plan som først tar oppgjør med fortida, for deretter å legge til grunn noen prinsipp for hvordan psykisk helsevern skal se ut i fremtiden. Hva handler det om? Jo, mange av de samme verdiene som vi finner i moral treatment. Framfor alt at pasientene skal være deltagende, et subjekt, en medborger. Og de samme verdiene vi finner i en voksende tilnærming som i dag blir kalt for recovery-perspektivet. Hvorfor forsvant moral treatment? Hvorfor må vi i dag så å si gjenopptakt? For hva? I galskapens historie sier jeg at da galskapen ved slutten av 1700-tallet ble konstituert som sinnsjukdom, var dialogen brutt. Psykiatriens språk ble fornuftens monolog over galskapen og stillhet av senkelse. Dialogen ble brutt. Kanskje var det vitenskapens objektiverende blikk som bidro til det. For psykiatrien i scene setter seg i vår historie som en slags proklamert orden som lovde å sette tinga på plass så å si for orden på galskapen. Det var et problem som skulle løses, og slik en ellers tok kontroll over naturen for å mestre den og forbedre den, slik en ellers mente å kunne bestemme planter og dyr sin en jaktig plass i naturen ved observasjon, måling og Sammenlingen mellom grupper, slik kunne også mennesket og de menneskelige variasjonene plasseres. Kemien og det periodiske systemet og denne svensken Linné, som var den vitenskapelige taksonomiens far, var det store forbilder i denne vitenskapelige ordensnevrosa som vokst frem. I hagebruk, som i medisin, ble det nyttige skilt fra det unyttige skilt, det regne fra det uregne. Emil Kreplin, født i 1856, som senere ble grunnlaget av det moderne kategorisystemet i psykiatrien, var lidenskapelig opptatt av botanikk, et fag han dyrket sammen med sin botanikerbror. Han hadde sett hvordan Biomedisinsk tenkning skapte framgang i somatisk medisin og mente at tilsvarende ville skje i psykiatrien om en la til grunn at disse fenomener kunne forstås 
som somatiske lidelser. Og med dette blikke er det følgelig sykdommen mer enn den syke personen som er av interesse. Den erfarende, opplevende og historiske kroppen ligger utenfor dette paradigmes rekke bildet. Ved å studere sykdommen utenfra som objekt uavhengig av den syke personen, vil en kunne komme fram til objektive behandlingsmetoder. Idealet er altså en universell eller kontekstfri medisin, og da trenger en en subjektløs pasient. Sigmund Freud, født samme år som Kreppelin, kom imidlertid til å få purre at biomedisinen ble et samlende paradigme for psykiatrien. Han erstattet det objektiverende blikket med å ta i bruk ørene. Han begynte å lytte til pasientene. Ut fra tanken om at psykisk lids kunne forstås ut fra levd liv. Slik ble den syke personen mer interessant enn sykdommen. Psykodynamisk tenkning fikk gjennomslag, særlig i USA i mellomkrigstida, og ble hegemonisk langt ut på 1960-tallet. I 1980 slo i midlertid Kreppelin tilbake. Død for lengst, men gjenfødt av en gruppe som omtalte seg selv som ny Kreppelinere, og som hadde som ambisjon å gjenreise psykiatrien som fag og vitenskap. Etter at det gjennom noen ti år hadde måttet tåle flengende kritikk, både fra sine egne, fra medisinens hovedhus, fra samfunnet og fra den gryende samfunnsvitenskapene. Nå skulle vitenskapeligheten gjenreises ved den nye versjonen av DSM, DSM 3 som også markerte Kreppelins gjenkomst av Kreppelins grunnidé. Hvordan har dette gått? Da den femte versjonen av DSM kom i 2013, bør vi nevne at den egentlig skulle komme i 2010, men underveis oppstår det betydelige kontroverser. Noen innenfor systemet falt fra, for eksempel den tidligere redaktøren av DSM-4, Ellen Francis, som innrømmer har bidratt til å skape tre falske epidemier, ADHD, etisme og bipolar hos barn, og bidratt til liberalisering av depresjonsdiagnosen, slik at dette har blitt en folkesjukdom til stor bestyrtelse for verdens helseorganisasjon og alle kvinner landets helsemyndighet. På den andre siden så var også Kreppelin sine tilhengere svært skuffet. Fordi at DSM-systemet hadde ikke levd opp til forventningene om å skape et diagnosesystem basert på biologiske markører. Deira medisin er likevel mer av samme slaget. Vi har ikke fått det til enda, men snart. Vi trenger bare mer forskning, mer kunnskap. Siden opptrappingsplanen ble skrevet, som på sett og vis var et tilbakevending til Pinell, har den internasjonale biomedisinske psykiatrien derimot nettet ønsket med tilbakevending til Kreppelin. Det er legitimt å spørre, etter all denne vitenskapligheten siden Pinell, hva har man oppnådd? Slik spør også opptrappingsplanen. Hvilke vitenskapelige resultater kan psykiatrien smykke seg med? Den spør retorisk. Har psykiatrien stått stille mens somatikken har stormet fremad? Det svarer et konstant nei. Det er lett å la seg blende av somatikkens romfastliggende instrumenter, heter det. 
Og selv om psyk- psykiatrien ikke kan skilte med slike øynfallende landevindinger, har framskrittet også der vært fantastisk. Er det grunnlag for et slikt syn? Har framskrittet vært fantastisk, bare gått litt senere enn i den somatiske medicin. Etter mitt syn går ikke psykiatrien fremover. Den går i ring. Den forandrer seg riktig nok. Det kommer stadig nye kunnskapsbiter. Men om kunnskapen er ny, er problemene gamle. Og det er grunnleggende sett forankret i fagets forståelse av seg selv og sitt gjenstandsfelt. Og i denne framgangsvisjonen så hevder man også at fortidens feilgrep hadde vært unngått om dagens standard for empirisk dokumentasjon hadde blitt fulgt. Det er en grå forenkling av historien. Både lobotomi og en rekke former for asylbehandling hadde frapperende virkning. Lobotomi virker jo dessverre alt for godt. At effektene også viste seg å være skadelige var en senere erkjennelse. Om dagens krav til evidensbasering med RCT-design og korte måletidspunkt ville mye trolig ha blitt kvalifisert som evidensbasert. I tillegg til at DSM-systemet vaklet er flere oppsu- forskningsoppsummeringer når det gjelder medikament i ferd med å dokumentere at denne revolusjonen kanskje har gjort mer skade enn gavn. Det vil vi sikkert høre mer om senere. Om vi som en tankeøvelse betrakter den biomedisinske forståelsen som en hypotese, satt fram av Emil Krepelin i 1883, da den store psykiatribok kom ut, så bør vi som gode popperianer i dag, vel 130 år senere, konkluderer med at hypotesen er falsifisert. I slike situasjoner er Poppers, Karl Poppers råd er det nødvendig med skarpe utfordringer fra alternative teorier. Slik heter det i vitenskapsteori, men i vera handler det også om makt og interesse. En ekte vitenskap innrømmer sine feil, analyserer dem og skaper en ny kurs. Og da omtaler man ikke lobotomi som et feilskjær, slik det nylig ble sagt. Kunnskap. Både i opptrappingsplanen og i sin alminnelighet i vår tid, så synes det å være en veldig utvittydig tru på at vi trenger mer kunnskap, mer forskning, en linær tankegang. Men det blir sjelden diskutert hva slags kunnskap og hva slags forskning. For fortidens vilfarelse kan ikke korrigeres gjennom empiri og pragmatisk vitenskapelighet, bare gjennom analyse av de kunnskapsfeilene som skapte denne form for vitenskapelighet. Historia om Adam og Eva kjenner vi alle. Det begynte med et eple fra kunnskapens tre. Hvor les endte det? Det tapte paradis. Mennesket så seg selv og så at det var nakent. Og det er et interessant poeng at Bibelens myt om vår skapelse så tydelig kopple eksistens og kunnskap. Livet er så å si kunnskapsbasert. Vi lever i en fysisk verden, men like mye i en symbolsk og ordskapt verden. Ord og navn. Vi klarer oss ikke uten. Tidvis griper vi til deg med begjær og klamrer oss til deg i angst. Selv er deg som kan fylle og tette sprekken i kunnskapssystemet våre, slik at det uforståelig ikke truer etablert orden som er galskap. For namngiving er en slags trøst, et roende teppe når vi kjenner kalde gufse fra det ukjente 
och det farliga. Men namn är er inte tingen själv. Vi tar för gitt att normalitet är er gitt som natur. Det normala tränger inte någon förklaring. Men och det är er så säkert. Skapelsesmyten handlar också om epistemisk ansvar. Vi utrivelen från paradis är er människa on her own. Och det är er ingen väg tillbaka till lycklig uvitenhet. Att kunskapslik också kan vara en farlig väg syns vi har glömt i vår kultur. Varseltrekanten om kunskapens gränse att kunskapen också kan leda oss fel och bli giftig och destruktiv var också en förståelse som våra greske forfedre var uppmärksam på. Men tapt uskyld kan dessvärre aldrig genvinnas. Däremot är er ydmykhet och besinnelse på kunskapens vägne en er möjlighet för oss alla. Jag ska inte repetera psykiatrins behandlingshistorie men se möteledaren sa att det hade en skarp tunge så kan jag kanske säga si att den behandlingshistorie har fört mer galskap med sig än galskap än själv. Kolla ska vi förstå felgrepp och övergrepp för den fortida mangel på kunskap mangel på etik Kunskapsteoretisk skyldes det en feil, og feilen handler om en ambition om å objektivere det som hører eksistensen til. En overdreven og til tider feilaktig objektivering av menneskelig subjektivitet. I denne ambition impliserer vi derfor at galskapen skyldes maskinfeil, vrangforestillinger, tomme talehandlinger, alt som inte refererar verken till verkligheten eller till en själ. Den är er i princip meningslös och kan följligen inte gripas med språk. Men det finns och har alltid varit andra positioner från fenologi där perspektivet är er sett innanför. Kan exempelvis en psykotisk värmåte tolkas som sammanbrudd av subjektivitet att av olika grunder er får smärtefullt att vara i världen som en speaking eye. Att en form för självobjektivering beskyttar en mot världen. En tidigare patient säger: "Det att bli psykotisk och se livet från ett helikopterperspektiv var ett mästringsförsök. Ett försök på att förbättra översikt över min egen psykiska smärta." Och en annan mer poetisk Psykose er sinnets flukt fra en virkelighet som er for vanskelig å bære. I et slikt perspektiv er mennesket et intentionalt vesen. Alle mentale realiteter handler om noe. Det har en innretning. Og denne innretningen sitt vesen er å bære oppe eksistensen ved å i scene sette en dialog mellom den indre og den yttre verden. Det vi kallar meningsdanning. Det som är er, är er den till en kvar tid definierade normala orden er inte gitt som natur. Men en kreation förutsatt av en bestämd biologisk organisation vävs in i kulturella meningssystem. Organismen organiserar. Och den mänskliga organismen organiserar mening. Utan detta vill en existentiell orden inte vara möjlig. Utan evne till att strukturera vara vill vår uppfattning av den bli gränslös och kaotisk. Ett pantare utan skille mellan ej och dig, mellan fantasi och rendom. Och från denna synsvinkel är er dialogen mellan den inre och yttre vara en kontinuerlig process som har sitt existentiella grundlag i behovet för att skapa identitet. Allt i 1939 så pekte psykiatern Harry Stack Sullivan på att så kallade schizofrene 
Han hade själv haft den diagnosen. Benyttat språket till att motverka en fundamental usikkerhet i förhåll till andra människor. Det är er tal handlingar motiverat för att skapa ett socialt rum där identiteten blir relativt trygg för angrepp. Vi kan kalla det en form för själ objektivering. Och lägger vi detta till grund så vill ju bara en objektiverande psykiatri förstärka detta. I ett sånt perspektiv så är det vi kallar hjälparbete slik det rådes i moral treatment och genupprätta dialogen med den andra. Och så ett poäng till psykiatrins egna övergrepp. Objektivering innebär ju också att vi reducerar den andra som subjekt då ökar avstånd mellan mig och dig. Och en slik avstånd önsk öka chanserna för inhumanitet. En objektiverande position som första perspektiv handlar således inte bara om kunskapssyn, men också om en etisk implikation. Och anstränga sig också när vi inte förstår med att vi likahåller den andra som ett subjekt är viktig för att beskydda oss själv mot vår egen inhumanitet. I kunsten. Ja, i kunsten. Vi har placerat kunsten i en helt annan värld. Men i kunsten har den gal alltid varit subjekt. Och listan är lång. Fra litteratur, musik och bilderkunst av de som har försökt att fange fenomenet galskap också utifrån egna erfarenheter. Och där er språk om galskap, mänskespråket. Det är er språk i det humana domänen. Om kolles passionerna, konflikten mellan begär och moral, plikt och skyld, sorg och sinne kan riva en person i frågvarande. Och i litteraturen blir galskapen så läs något som både genkännlig och framant. Flik kunsten är er det för den gäll existensens grundvillkor fört ut till sin yttre gräns. Och om vi inte kunde känna oss igen ville det inte fungerat som kunst. Som Herman Melville amerikanske författaren säger in all of us lodges the same fuel to light the same fire and he who has never felt momentarily what madness is has but a mouthful of brains vi människor är er dömt till samboerskap med oss själ men men så kan inte få tolka sig själ genom sig själ och existera innebär också att vara utlever till andra människor. Och vara människa innebär grundläggande sett och måtte vara med människa. Men att vara utlever till andra är er inte oproblematiska grejer. Det är er det viktigaste och därför också det mest vanskliga. I den andra ligger det möjliga paradis och det möjliga helvetet. Inte något är viktigare, inte något är vanskligare. Inte något tillfälle är er mer sårbara och mer trua än i förhåll till en annans blick. Författaren Fernando Pessoa säger boka uro om sin eja känslevarhet att den är er som en flamme som blaffrar i vinden. Och slik blir också förhållet till andra liv i sig essentiella utfordring. Citat: Det händer ibland plötsligt och utan förvarsel att det vardagsliga snörer sig om halsen min och jag blir fysisk kvalm av vår så kallt nästa stämma och fysiognomi. 
En angst for alle ting siver ut gjennom porene mine, og jeg blir svimmel av å føle slik. Å leve side om side med andre mennesker er tortur. Jeg bærer de andre med meg. Om jeg så befinner meg langt borte fra dem, er jeg tvunget til å leve sammen med dem. Når jeg er alene, trenger mengden seg inn på meg. Jeg har ikke et sted å flykte om jeg ikke flykter fra meg selv. Livskjensla, kjensla av å måtte være subjekt, omtaler han som bevissthetens pine, kraftløshet, kvalme og angstfullt begjær, og en lengsel om å slippe fri. I dette perspektivet kan galskapen også sjås på som asyl, fristed, et indre eksil. Å se dette er vanskelig for oss, fordi vi tar det for gitt, at galskap bare er skrekk og gru der ingen skulle bo. Det kan det tidvis naturligvis også være, men alltid. Forfatteren Olav H. Hauge vet litt om dette. Han budde der noen ganger. Og i dagbøkene sine klager han fagfolka for sine grå og triste framstillinger og spør. Er det nå alltid tilfelle? Nei, sa han. Det kan også være sæle, herlige draumer, syner, gjør at yverjordiske tilstander slik jeg lever i, hvor lite de kloke vet. De skulle bare vite, galne folk har det alltid gått. Olav H. Hauge vurderte perioden sine med sin sykdom som en egen livsdimensjon. Psykosene kaller han en diamantsvevn og sier... Galenskap hører mennesket til. Det er bare en side av det menneskelige syke. Hvit har sin motpol i vannhvit. Det er baksida i tilværet. Det lyter så være, og det lyter være en viss balanse mellom de to. Selv om det koster han mye å være midt oppi det, og ikke minst komme seg gjennom det, gir han i dagbøken sine flere plasser uttrykk for Takksemd over at han fikk være i fred med synet sine. Men Guds lov fanns det da hus for slike tussinger. Der kunne du drømme og dikta så mye du ville, og ingen prøvde å kurere det heller. Så langt var ikke tid i komme. Jeg treves der. Men så legger han til mot slutten. Men så fann det på at jeg skulle kurere deg, gjøre folk av deg, det ledde. Da var det herlige dagene ute. For Hauge var galskap å være bortrykt. Han bruker menneskespråket. Og bortrykkingen førte til et møte med den han kaller den andre mannen i seg. Og han sier om den andre mannen, det er han som kjøpte ord. Det er sørgelig han skal være så vill. Han er i alt en motsetning til denne stakkars uslingen som heter eg. Denne kvardagspuslingen, denne skrelingen. Nei, det er sørgelig han skal være så vill. Det spørs om man ikke skulle komme til ord så oftere. Som er i kvardagslag, så vort han ikke så vill og galen når han tek velde. Og Hauge er inne på et vesentlig poeng. Han synes en ambivalens i forhold til sin egen galskap. Den har både noe frien og noe tillokkende ved seg. Noen kan flykte inn i, og samtidig noe som tar over styringen. Dilemmet er å bli ført eller føre sitt liv. Det er nødsynt å komme ned på jordi. Skal den være her i veri, sier han. Det Hauge gjør er at han i ettertid gjennesetter seg selv som subjekt. Han gjør seg selv til en aktør og ikke bare et offer for en sykdom. Galskapen og kunsten sitt felles vesen er at det går føre seg på grenser til uorden i eksistensen sin utkant. En blir neppe kunstner uten å kjenne livet sitt tyngde og djupne. I slike grensereise er kunsten meningsskaping, mønstre som blir den sammen. I galskapen bryter kunsten sammen. 
Hauge seier litt tørt om dette. Å få galne folk til å lese vers er ikke noe klein terapeut i. Men legger også til kurerte folk er prosaiske og kan vanskelig lyfte seg over hverdagen mer. Og hva gjør det om sumer underlige? Det finnes så mange normale likevel. Jeg startet dette foredraget med fortelling om en fransk mann. Så la jeg avslutte til å vise til en annen fransk mann. Psykiateren Gerard Pommier. Høyst nålevende, og som jeg har lånt titelen til dette foredraget ifra. Han viser til hvordan århundre med klinisk erfaring og observasjoner gjort i den europeiske psykiatrien, som gjorde en i stand til å skille mellom lidelse som krevde medikamentell hjelp og det som best kunne løses ved livet selv. Nå har legemiddelindustrien med sitt tynne skinn av vitenskapelighet tatt over og rasert denne kunnskapskulturen og gjort normale plage til patologier. Den biomedisinske psykiatrien som har hatt sin historie har ikke blitt spesielt enmuk. Den ekspanderer, som vi hørte av Einar innledningsvis, i vår tid. Ordet depresjon fyller alt mørk. Det er blitt en del av daglig talen og gjort en sykdom. Mens Konfusius anbefalte en sønn å sørge i tre år etter farens død, er du i dag syk, eller kan bli det om du sørger mer enn 15 dager. DSM, det amerikanske diagnosesystemet, sin markedsføring er enkel, sier på meg. Det man trenger å gjøre er å blande sammen det patologiske og det eksistensielle. Og det er nok så lett. For eksistensen bruker det som går på tverke i livet vårt for å komme seg videre. Det som ikke går rett vei og som gir oss energi til å falle eller til å skape. DSM sitt budskap er klart. Ikke bekymre deg. Dine plager er ikke din skyld. Det skyldes genene dine, hormonene dine, nevroutviklingsforstyrrelse. Men slapp av. Legemidlene våre vil ordne alt. Når diagnosene blir liberalisert, blir det flere deprimerte, selvsagt. Og denne økingen har skapt store bekymringer i WHO og våre nasjonale helsemyndigheter. Der tar man for gitt at fenomenet depresjon ligger der ferdig som natur, så å si. Uten å stille spørsmål om hvordan tinga blir skapt. Uten å stille spørsmål om vi var måte å tenke om disse fenomenene på, også bidrar til å skape deg. Og dermed også frata ungdom, ikke minst det språk de trenger å ha for å mestre eksistensens utfordring. Seneste oppslag, 40 prosent av unge jenter deprimerte. Alarm, alarm. La meg minne om at grensene for normalitet er ikke noe som er gitt. Det skapes. 
Och kornens dessa gränsne skapas är er ganska viktig för det har stora konsekvenser. Och gränsne och skapning av gränsen är er allt för viktig till att överlates till dig som konstruerar diagnose manuellt. Det har inte bara ekonomiska implikationer, för exempel hur stort ska hälsovärsen vara, men i sist instans påverkar det vår egen självförståelse. Kan är er ett gott nok menneske? Kan slags lyte, problem och ska vanka höra livet till? Om humanitet är er motivation för vår iver att behandla, hjälpa, reparera och korrigera kan resultatet paradoxalt nog på längre sikt bli inhumanitet. Det normala och allmänliga blir gjort främmande och unormalt. Och mänskligt språk och existensens villkor och vanska blir spist upp. Sjukliggöring och professionalisering av stadig fler livsområden representerar också ett demokratiproblem. För det är det livsfrågor, gör det till fagliga frågor och indras i fagens expertspråk så underminerar en disse frågorens tillhörlighet i livsvärlden en underminera människans egen mestrings evne och skjule att dessa fenomen också hör med i politiken och i ett språk som är er tändlig för folk flest. Tack för mig. Tusen tack till Tor Johan. När jag introducerade dig så skulle jag ju sagt att du är er en väldigt klok man också, men det är er för så vidt unødvendig, för det har alla som har hört dig skönt. Då är er vi faktiskt lite föran körplan och då utvider vi pausen lite grann. Vi starter igen om 20 minuter. Klockan mig är er lite för fort. Då starter vi en 10 över 6. Ja.
Da er det fint at dere inntar plassen igjen. Skal vi straks begynne? Der kommer Reinar også. Da kan vi starte. Så nå har jeg hatt pleasure av velkommen og introducing vår gjest fra England, Joanne Moncrief. Hun er en psykiatrist og en senior lecturer på University College i London. She has also for many years been a consultant for a psychiatric rehabilitation inpatient unit, helping people with severe and long-lasting mental health issues. She has uh, written extensively and uh, published uh, several books, including the book that you will uh, get as a gift after, after her presentation. And it's also important to note that she is one of the founding members of the, what is called the Critical Psychiatry Network, which consists of psychi psychiatrists from all over the world, psychiatrists who are skeptical about the idea that mental disorders are simply brain diseases and skeptical about the dominance of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, and as you see on the board here, the, the title of Joanna's presentation is The Myth of the Chemical Cure, Explaining the Real Nature of Psychiatric Drugs and the Consequences of Their Use. So please welcome Joanna. Thank you. Uh, no, I'm, fi I'm fine with this, yeah. Um, so thank you, Holbert, for that introduction. Thank you, Ina, for organizing this meeting and, and um, getting me over here. And um, I really enjoyed Professor Eklund's talk or little whisperings that, that Magnus whispered to me while, um, uh, while it was going on. Um, it made, me, it made me think of a quotation by Thomas Saz, which goes something like this. Medical treatment does not make us feel guilty, and therein lies the danger to the patient. It was the ideas about objectifying um, people and the ideas about treating illness rather than treating people that made me think of that. And that also reminded me um, of something that was said by a psychiatrist called Henry Maudsley, who was a very well-known, respected psychiatrist working at the beginning of the 20th century in England. And he said that restraining people with drugs was more cruel than restraining people with chains that altering people's minds in ways they didn't want to have them altered was a worse thing to do. And I suppose what I want to talk about today is really how we forgot that thought, um, how we forgot to think of drugs as chemical restraints and how we learnt to think of them as medical treatments and what the consequences are of that transformation in our thinking. Um, so... I've, I've got lots of writing on the slides, but it's really just to jog my memory. So please don't don't try and read everything that's up there. I will uh, I'll say what's important. Um, but if anyone would like a copy of the slides afterwards, please let let Ina know, and I and and I'd be very happy for people to have them. Um, so so th uh, th these are just some of the books I've written in case people want to follow up uh, any of my ideas, my ideas, and one of them is translated into Norwegian. But what I wanted to say first is just to show you this graph, which is out of date now, but just shows you the staggering increase in the amount of drugs that we are consuming for mental health problems in the United Kingdom and across the world. Um, in fact, now not just in the developed world, but in the developing world too. When I, when I looked at the figures, I thought that maybe the use of some drugs 
would increase but be compensated by, for by a fall in the use of other drugs. But it turned out that was not the case. The use of all drugs, more or less, was, was increasing. But particularly antidepressants, which is the, the green line on the graph there. And that increase in use has gone along with very heavy-duty promotion of this idea that what the drugs are doing is reversing an underlying chemical imbalance. So with uh, antidepressants, the message has often been that they're correcting an imbalance in serotonin, um, which is said to be the, the cause of depression. And um, with antipsychotics, it's sometimes said they're correcting an underlying imbalance in um, dopamine. And this, uh, this idea of the chemical imbalance is one way of expressing the, the mainstream view of what psychiatric drugs do, which is that they target and correct an underlying biological abnormality. Sometimes that's said to be a chemical imbalance. Sometimes people st talk about there being abnormalities of neural networks. It's never quite clear to me what that means, but that's another um, idea that's, that's uh, expressed. And what I've been saying for many years is that there's really no evidence for this idea, for this assumption about how drugs work at all. <coughs> um, and the reason that there's no evidence for this is that we don't know the underlying mechanisms for any psychiatric disorders or even symptoms. The placebo-controlled trials that form the main part of the evidence on which we use drug treatments do not distinguish, do, do not confirm that drugs work on an underlying disease mechanism. There are other ways of explaining what drugs might be doing. And other evidence that, that uh, drugs might have uh, effects that target underlying mechanisms is lacking. So what, what, I've done in, in, um, what I've done to try and make this clear is to formulate two different ways that we can think about the way that drugs work uh, in psychiatry when they're given for um, mental health problems. And that mainstream view is what I've called the disease-centered model of drug action. So this is the idea, as I said, that drugs are working by correcting or helping to correct an underlying abnormal brain state. Um, and this, uh, and, and, and that the, the, the therapeutic effects arise from the effects of the drug on the underlying abnormality. This is an, uh, a model that is borrowed from general medicine, where most drugs can correctly be understood to work in this way. So uh, to work in a disease-centered way, the drug doesn't necessarily need to target the, ult the ultimate cause of the disease. <clears throat> um, drugs may just act on the mechanisms that produce symptoms. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. So um, if you think of... Uh, treatments for asthma, for example, uh, salbutamol, it doesn't cure, it doesn't, it doesn't remove the cause of asthma, but it relaxes the airways, the, the bronchioles, um, and by relaxing the airways, it treats the symptoms of wheeze, it improve, you know, it enables people to breathe more easily. So I'm calling that a disease-centered mechanism, even though it's not acting on the very ultimate cause of the disease, it's acting on the processes that produce the symptoms. Um, and, uh, and the alternative way of thinking about what drugs do when they're prescribed for psychiatric problems is what I've called a drug-centered model. And this is, this is um, suggesting that far from correcting an underlying abnormality, what drugs are doing is creating an underlying, uh, creating an abnormal or altered state of the brain. And so this way of thinking about what drugs do is seeing them, understanding them as psychoactive substances that are not categorically different from the sort of psychoactive substances that um, 
that we come across in other situations like alcohol or cannabis or cocaine, etc. And what this model is saying is that the useful effects the useful effects of drugs when they occur, occur not because the drugs are rectifying an underlying abnormality, but they occur because the alterations to normal functioning that the drugs produce are superimposed on the symptoms or difficulties that someone is having. So an example I've written down on this table is the use of alcohol for social anxiety. So we know that the characteristic alterations produced by alcohol include feelings of disinhibition, feelings of relaxation. Um, so when someone is very socially anxious, if you superimpose those effects onto their anxiety, it helps reduce the anxiety. We can also think of, um, we have in English an expression called drowning your sorrows. Um, uh, which means that, you know, you, when you feel depressed, you might go out and, and get drunk. Now, no one's suggesting that that's really curing or addressing the, the cause of your problems. What they're suggesting is that the alterations caused by alcohol temporarily override your depressed feelings. Another example that I think is useful because I think it shows the difference between these two models is to think about painkillers. So there are painkillers that do not alter your mental state. So a painkiller like aspirin or ibuprofen, I presume the names are similar in Norwegian, um, or paracetamol, these do not, they're not psychoactive substances. They don't generally make people feel um, or think differently. Um, they target the mechanisms that produce pain, and they, they reduce pain by doing that. But opiate analgesics, like heroin or morphine, are psychoactive substances. Now, they probably have some direct effect on pain mechanisms. They probably have some disease-centered effect. But they also characteristically induce this, this psychological state where people describe themselves as feeling emotionally disinterested or indifferent. And people who've taken opiates for pain will often say that they still have some pain, but they don't care about it anymore. And that aspect of their effect is what I'm calling a drug-centered effect. It's a consequence of their the, the, the mental and behavioral alterations that they produce. So as I said, this drug-centered way of thinking about the effects of drugs is thinking of them as psychoactive substances. Now, <clears throat> psychoactive drugs, by definition, are drugs that uh, cross the blood-brain barrier and therefore change the way that the brain normally functions. Um, so they produce changes in normal thinking processes and emotions and behavior. They also cause physical alterations, which are often linked with the mental alterations they produce. So um, drugs like uh, sedatives, like, like Valium, for example, produce a state that is both a state of mental and physical relaxation. And the same for stimulant drugs like amphetamines. They are both physically and mentally stimulating. The effects of the, the alterations produced by some drugs are, or are experienced as pleasant by some people. Uh, so, so some people like the effects of alcohol and cocaine and cannabis. There's individual variation, of course, but generally... Uh, some people at least like the changes that are produced by, rec by the psychoactive drugs that have become recreational substances. But there are some psychoactive drugs that produce changes that most people experience as fairly unpleasant. Uh, so most people experience taking what we now call antipsychotic drugs as being uh, an unpleasant experience. Uh, and the same strangely uh, as well with most drugs that are called antidepressants. So people have used psychoactive substances to change their 
mental functioning for for millennia. And one of the reasons they've used them is to alleviate feelings of misery um, and uh, anxiety and stress. So this is um, a picture by the English painter uh, William Hogarth of uh, of London in the 18th century in the middle of the gin epidemic. So people were drinking a lot of gin and this is known as Gin Lane and just showing everyone being very drunk. In the 19th century, people used a mixture of alcohol, people used opium um, widely and this uh, this preparation called laudanum was very popular, which was a mixture of opium and alcohol. And people used it to deal with pain, but also um, to, to deal with uh, depression and anxiety and things like that. Um, cocaine was a very popular substance in the 19th century as well. And that was also put into tinctures, which were widely available and promoted. And this particular um, preparation, which was called vin, vin, wine Mariana, Mariani, after the um, chemist that, that, that concocted it, the Portuguese chemist, um, it was so popular with the Pope Leo III that it won a gold award from the Vatican. Um, and it was a mixture of cocaine and Bordeaux wine. And, of course, the most famous cocaine-containing um, drink was Coca-Cola, uh, which was widely promo promoted for its stimulant properties, for being able to keep you awake at work. <clears throat> now, prescription drugs uh, cottoned on to this, um, the, 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 these sort of uses of psychoactive substances in the early 20th century, and they were very much promoted for their mind-altering properties in the same sort of way. So this is an early advertisement for amphetamines, which were widely prescribed uh, for a whole variety of sort of issues like fatigue, depression, anxiety, stress. Um, and this advertisement, I think, shows you how they're clearly being promoted as uh, showing that they're going to make you smarter and more confident and more alert. So they're being promoted for the sorts of alterations that they are known to produce. And this is uh, an advertisement for barbiturates, a sedative substance, which are, again, being promoted for their sedative sleep-inducing effects. As we get into the 1960s and 70s, a lot of barbiturate-like substances are produced. Um, and this one is uh, being promoted to the bored, house, the bored and frustrated housewife. The text of this says that what, what she'd really like is a, a week's holiday in Bermuda, but you can't give her that. So, so Milltown will, will, be the, um, will be just as good. <laughs> Ritalin. Uh, a stimulant drug being advertised to help you get your housework done. And um, a benzodiazepine drug, oxazepam, is here being advertised um, to, to deal with the stress of not being able to get your housework done in time. You, you will notice that these are all being targeted at women, uh, mostly middle-aged women um, or women who, you know, married women. Um, and and those, those, that's still the group that take the, the majority of mind-altering drugs of any sort. So that is the situation into which um, modern psychiatric drugs are introduced. And the first, the, the first drug that's sort of uh, recognizably of the modern generation of drugs is, was called chlorpromazine, and it was first used by French psychiatrists in psychiatric hospitals in Paris. And when it was introduced, it was thought of, according to that sort of drug-centered model, as a special sort of sedative. And it was referred to early on as a neurological inhibitor, uh, and then later it was widely known as a neuroleptic, which means something similar. Lepsis means to seize or restrain the nervous system. And as I said, early on, this was very much understood 
according to a drug-centred model as a type of tranquilizer. Here it is in 1960 being advertised clearly for its tranquilizing properties. Of course, it's tra the fact that it had tranquilizing properties meant that it could be advertised to all sorts of groups and it, um, chlorpromazine and other similar drugs were widely advertised for uh, dealing with agitation in the elderly, for dealing with behavioral problems in children and anxiety in adults, as well as being advertised for the use of schizophrenia or psychosis um, in, uh, in, in people who would have been at that time in, in psychiatric hospitals. But over the course of the 1960s and 70s, those ideas about what drugs were doing changed and the idea that these were mind-altering substances was replaced by the idea that they were disease-targeting substances. And quotes from textbooks, which is what is on this slide, started to suggest that these drugs were penetrating to the site of the mechanism of the disease in some way that wasn't quite understood. <clears throat> so by 1970, this is the same drug as this, and by 1970, it's being advertised as targeting an underlying abnormality, as being a targeted treatment for schizophrenia. Um, it's a psychedelic target because it's 1970, but nevertheless, it's a target. And there's start, it's starting to be referred to, as you can see here, as, having a, as being an antipsychotic. And a similar process happens with antidepressants. So the first drugs that are suggested to be antidepressant drugs are actually stimulant-type substances that are being used for the treatment of tuberculosis. And the early papers make it very clear that they are stimulant substances, um, that if people take them for too long, they can become psychotic, they stop sleeping. Um, but later papers start to refer to these properties as side effects. And gradually, the, the drugs start to be talked of as more specific than stimulants and having specific antidepressant effects. And then, of course, and then, in fact, drugs come along that don't, don't have stimulant properties anyway that get called antidepressants. So what happens over the course of the 50s, 60s, and 70s is this change from thinking of drugs according to a drug-centered model, thinking of them as psychoactive substances that alter normal mental states to thinking of them as disease-targeting treatments. And you can see this change most clearly in the way that drugs are named and classified. So prior to 19, the 1950s, drugs are just very crudely um, divided up into sedatives or stimulants. But after the 1950s, they start to be classified and named according to the disease they are thought to treat. So they start to be called antipsychotics, antidepressants, anxiolytics, etc. And the whole drug classification system is reorganized at this time um, to reflect diseases rather than drug properties. Now, this transformation in thinking does not happen because there's a lot of evidence that the disease-centered model is true, is correct, is, is better um, than thinking in terms of the drug-centered model. Um, the majority of evidence for the use of, of these drugs, as I said, is, can, comes from placebo-controlled trials, and they do not distinguish between whether a drug is acting in a disease-centered or a drug-centered way. They're just comparing a drug with an inert placebo, so the differences could be due to either. Um, what, what happens is that people start to suggest that maybe the drugs are targeting an underlying disease, and that idea seems to be so popular that it just catches on and people forget that there was any other way of thinking about what the drugs might be doing. So if you wind forward to the 1990s, when um, Prozac comes along and a whole load of new antipsychotics come along, no one at that point any longer asks, what sort of drugs are these? What do they do to people? What do they make people feel like? It seems such a basic question to ask, but by the 1990s, 
everyone is so preoccupied by this idea that the drugs are targeting a disease that they're not asking those questions anymore. So what does the drug-centered model suggest about how psychiatric drugs work? Well, first of all, as I said, it suggests that there is an interaction between the alterations produced by the drugs and the symptoms or problems that someone has, which may sometimes be useful. Um, but also, of course, we shouldn't forget that there are placebo effects and uh, what we might call, call amplified placebo effects as well. So I'm just going to have a think about these ideas in relation to antidepressant drugs. Um, and how, and, and how they work out. So the first thing to say is that the commonly promoted idea that depression is due to a chemical imbalance to a deficiency of serotonin or noradrenaline or anything else has not been established. This idea came about because the pharmaceutical industry had drugs that they knew had, did something to the serotonin system um, they wanted to distinguish those drugs from the benzodiazepines that had been around in the 1980s. And so they put forward this idea that depression was due to a serotonin deficiency. Research on serotonin receptors, which was um, some of the research that was initially said to, promote, to um, support this idea, in fact doesn't support this idea at all. Um, there are some studies that show that people with depression have higher levels of serotonin receptors in their brains than, than normal people. Some studies that show they have lower levels, as you uh, might predict from the theory, and many studies that show no difference. And overall, there's no clear pattern um, from, from the studies. And the same for um, uh, studies that have been done on suicide victims. There were some studies done uh, giving people a diet that was deficient in tryptophan, that's an uh, enzyme which is used to make serotonin, and uh, some of the studies with people who'd previously had depression, apparently this diet was able to provoke depression in some people, although those people had already been treated with SSRIs, which had probably messed with their serotonin system to some extent. When this was done with volunteers, in fact, it didn't produce depression. But more interesting research is, um, it, it comes from the 1970s, where they used a much stronger drug that depletes serotonin um, much more completely. And what this shows is that depleting your serotonin does cause psychiatric problems, but not depression. It causes a state that's characterized by insomnia and aggression, hypersexual behavior, um, irritability, and, and a sort of hypersensitivity to the environment. So that's what happens if you deplete depression, not, uh, deplete serotonin, not, uh, not depression. Recently, there have been ideas uh, in the UK, at least, that depression might be due to inflammation. And um, a, a scientist from Cambridge has just produced this book called The Inflamed Mind. So I started to look into this um, because I was doing a debate with someone else who um, has been involved in this research. And... and and the research is based on the fact that some people with depression show increases in some inflammatory markers. But it turns out that all sorts of things affect inflammatory markers. Insomnia affects inflammatory markers. Exercise affects your inflammatory markers. Sleep deprivation. Social class. People vary by social class according to uh, levels of inflammatory markers. And none of these things have been controlled in any of the studies that have looked at these markers in people with depression. Um, so it's highly, highly likely that any association that exists between inflammatory markers and depression is a consequence of the, uh, of the association between inflammation and other aspects of lifestyle, particularly probably sleep, exercise, stress, etc. So what are antidepressants and might they be helpful? So there are different classes of antidepressants, as you might know. And the, uh, one of the earliest classes 
that was introduced in the 1960s, not, not the very earliest ones, not the, not the treatments for TB, uh, the next generation, are called tricyclic antidepressants. Some of these are still used, like amitriptyline. I don't know if it's got a similar name, similar name, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, imipramine, clomipramine is still used. So what sort of alterations do these drugs produce? Well, these, they're highly sedating drugs, and if you look at volunteer studies, there aren't many, but there are one or two, they show that volunteers feel sleepy, drowsy, have difficulty doing cognitive tests, and show slow waves on their ECG, which is tip, uh, EEG, which is typical of sedating drugs, and find them rather unpleasant to take. Um, what about modern antidepressants like um, the serotonin, um, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors like Prozac, um, Paxil or Paroxetine, uh, what other ones, Sertraline? These are, these are still the, probably the most commonly prescribed drugs. The first ones were introduced in the early 1990s. So these drugs are more subtle, have more subtle um, cause more subtle alterations than many other sorts of psychiatric drugs. But they do seem to produce um, alterations which can be characterized as, um, on the one hand, producing a state of listlessness, lethargy, emotional, um, emotional numbness, or some, some people call it, uh, refer to it as emotional blocking, feel that, feeling they just can't sort of access their emotions properly. Um, and a loss of motivation. And uh, that's, those effects are associated with a loss of uh, sexual drive, a loss of libido, which is quite well recognized. On the other hand, in some people, and particularly it seems in younger people, they also seem to cause feelings of tension and irritability and mood lability, which may be um, linked to their ability to increase suicidal thinking in, in some people, which has been um, shown in a number of um, studies now. So, so the question is really, are those effects useful? Um, uh, they sound as if they might be quite unpleasant, but maybe there are some situations in which they, uh, they are more useful than, than not. A few years ago, there were um, a, a few years ago there was starting to be a debate in the British media about the very widespread prescribing of antidepressants, and people were starting to ask questions about really were these helpful? Was it was it really a good thing that you know such a large proportion of the population were taking them? Um, that more more people in Britain were taking them in, than in Greece, for example, as this headline says. But then in February last year, uh, this year, um, so just over six months ago, um, a new study, a new meta-analysis was uh, published, which was widely publicized as showing definitively that antidepressants work, that they are useful. Um, and other headlines suggested that this showed that, that more of them should be prescribed rather than less. And these headlines were based on this study, which is uh, a meta-analysis of individual antidepressant trials that was published by, led by a group from Oxford and published in The Lancet. And what it showed was that, um, that antidepressants improved your chances of showing a response by between one and a half and 2.3 times compared to a placebo. Now, there, there are a number of problems with presenting the data like that. The first problem is that there is no such thing as a response. A response is an artificial category that's been made up by the researchers. What they actually, what they actually measure in these trials is they, they, they do a depression questionnaire with people and they score people according to all the questions on the questionnaire, and then they give people a final score for the questionnaire. Um, so, for example, the most commonly used questionnaire is the Hamilton Rating Scale for Depression, um, and that uh, 
uh, and that has about, I think the most, the, the most commonly used version has 17 questions and the maximum number of points you can score is 54. So you will get a score out of 54. That's, that's the actual data that's collected. Um, and in order to produce a response, what happens is someone's decided quite arbitrarily that if you show a 50% reduction in your scores, then you're going to count as showing a response. Now, when you categorize data like that, you can convert very small differences to quite large differences. So this graph shows you an example of where the difference in the scores was very small, just one to two points on the Hamilton scale out of 54. But you end up with quite a, quite a substantial difference in response rates. That graph led to a response rate on the drug of 50%, but only a response rate on the placebo of 32%. So that sounds quite impressive, whereas the, gra the difference in the graph um, at you know, one and a half points out of 54 points sounds pretty trivial. In fact, if you look at this meta-analysis, the results of this meta-analysis and all other recent meta-analyses, they show the same thing. They show that the difference in, um, in scores is around what's called 0.3 of an effect size. Now, that doesn't mean very much, but that translates into a difference in Hamilton rating scale scores of between uh, 1.7 and 2.5 points. And remember, the maximum score is 54, so that's not very many. And in fact, if we compare um, Hamilton score changes with categories of improvement on another instrument called the Clinical Global Improvement Scale, you can see that you need three points to show any sort of um, more than three points to show any sort of change. At three points, no one you're rated as having no showing no change on the clinical global impressions scale. You need to show eight points difference to um, to be rated as showing a minimal improvement, and a fourteen point difference to be rated as showing a substantial improvement. So a difference of two points on the Hamilton score or less is a very trivial difference that would basically not be noticed by someone who was uh, rate, you know, making a sort of clinical judgment about whether or not you'd improved. And even those small differences <coughs> between the drug and placebo um, may be accounted for in other ways. Uh, one of the, the main things is that um, is that there, the, these double-blind trials are probably not securely double-blind because, of course, a placebo is an inactive substance. You're comparing that with a drug which is an active substance, which is going to have some side effects. So many people in placebo control trials can detect whether they're on the placebo or the active drug. And nowadays, people get lots of information about all the side effects they might expect. Um, they have a very detailed uh, explanation about the fact that they're going to be randomized and they don't know what they're going to be randomized to. So people actually, I've, I've worked on a trial and I know that the people who are randomized in trials spend a lot of time trying to work out what they're taking, whether they've got the real drug or not. So it's very likely that even though trials are supposed to be double blind and supposed to um, to control out the placebo effect, that there still is a placebo effect because people um, are still going to be having a different experience taking the actual drug from taking uh, the placebo substance. And if you look at the effects of antidepressants in real life studies, that's not trials which are placebo controlled and short term, but real life studies that follow people up for longer, the results are really quite poor. So this was a massive trial that was conducted in the United States, by far and away the biggest trial ever done of antidepressants. It involved 4,000 patients. And, um, and, and, and what it found here is that the proportion of people who the proportion of people who got better in the first place is the second column. So that's 
maybe about a third of the population. But the proportion of people who stayed well, stayed in the study and stayed on their prescribed uh, medication um, and didn't relapse was very, very small. It was 150 people out of 4,000. Um, that's not to say that some of the people who dropped out probably got better too, but they didn't, they, they didn't like the drugs they were prescribed, so they dropped out. So again, it wasn't, um, wasn't really successful for them either. Um, that was called the STAR-D trial. And, uh, and, and the... Uh, yeah, and, and some... The, the, the full results were never really properly published at the time because it was so poor and have only recently come out. Um, and, and this it just shows you a graph of claims for disability benefits for different sorts of medical conditions um, in the UK over the last decade. And what you can see here is a huge increase in the amount of disability claims for mental disorders, the majority of which consist of anxiety and depression. And that's at a time where there's been this huge, huge increase in the prescribing of antidepressants. So clearly, they're not really helping people get back to work or, or get really well again. Um, so it doesn't seem as it doesn't seem from the research as if they have many useful effects in depression at least. Um, what about their adverse effects? Well, sexual impairment is very common while people are taking them. About sixty percent of of people experience some form of sexual impairment, sexual dysfunction. Um, but what is less well known, and I think very worrying, is that sometimes this problem can persist after the drugs have been stopped. So there are increasing reports of this happening. Again, this is not being reported in the mental health literature. It's being reported mainly in the sexual health literature. People are coming to sexual health clinics and saying, since I stopped my Prozac, you know, I just can't, I just don't seem to have the same level of desire. Um, and, um, and a similar problem, I think, is that there are, it's well rec recognized now that there are withdrawal effects from some of these antidepressants when you stop taking them. Sometimes these withdrawal effects seem to be very severe and very prolonged. So some people are experiencing these unpleasant withdrawal effects for months and even for years after stopping taking antidepressants, particularly if they've taken them for some time. So, so both of these things suggest that these drugs are making quite long-term alterations in, in bodily functions. Um, I mentioned that there does seem to be consistent evidence now that in young people at least, these drugs can increase suicidal thoughts. This has been a very um, difficult issue to untangle because, of course, people who are depressed sometimes get suicidal. And so it's often difficult to know whether it's the drug treatment or, um, or the underlying problem. But there does seem to be evidence, consistent evidence now from trials that they do increase the, um, the occurrence of suicidal thoughts and, and um, self-harm. Um, and, uh, and, and th there's also this uh, set of research on the long-term effects of antidepressants. We were talking to journalists earlier, actually, and I think it's one of the things that's really important to highlight about psychiatric research is that the vast majority of studies on which our drug treatment is based are short-term. They last 12 weeks at most. And yet people are treated with these drugs for years and years, and therefore we really have very little information about what sort of changes might happen in, um, in that sort of situation. The, um, one of the few sets of studies that have looked at this is studies that looked at the effects of giving um, SSRIs to pregnant animals. And they found that the offspring of these animals showed some subtle behavioral changes consisting of reduced sexual behavior, um, decreased exploration, and decreased um, social interaction. So again, this, 
the, the, the drugs, and, and, and these animals are not taking the drugs at the time, they were just exposed to them in utero, uh, but they seem to have had these long-term effects. So thinking about the treatment of depression from a drug-centered perspective, I think suggests to us that, um, that probably the effects of antidepressants are not that useful. They do seem to have this emotion blocking effect and there may be times when people are feeling deeply, deeply unhappy when that sort of effect is, is welcome or is a relief. But, the, but the, the trials don't really seem to suggest that, that, that even that makes a substantial difference. I don't want to give you the impression that the serious adverse effects are common, the sort of pro prolonged withdrawal symptoms or the sexual dysfunction. We, we, well, we don't know how common they are. I suspect they're not that common, but they do, but they do happen. It is a risk of, of taking these, these drugs. So, so my uh, feeling about antidepressants is that in most cases, it is not worth taking them. Um, if someone is very agitated or anxious, then temporary use of a sedative drug might be useful to help sleep or just to help someone calm down or get through a stressful period. But it should always be temporary because we know those drugs um, are also associated, associated with nasty withdrawal effects. Um, I, I uh, would really, really recommend this book by a journalist, an American journalist called Gary Greenberg called Manufacturing Depression. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. He puts himself into an antidepressant study uh, and talks about how he tries to work out whether he's getting the real drug or not. But um, an episode in this I found very interesting was he, he recounts an episode of taking ecstasy with his girlfriend before, um, when he goes to a concert. He describes himself, the reason he went into a trial, he describes himself as a sort of chronically miserable, grumpy and pessimistic person um, who thinks he, you know, he, thinks he might, have, might, um, might qualify for a diagnosis of dysthymia or chronic mild depression or something like that. Um, and, uh, and, and he's had this chronically ambivalent relationship with his girlfriend. Anyway, he takes this ecstasy and suddenly he has this revelation that really he does love his girlfriend very much and actually the world is not nearly as awful and depressing as he thought it was. And obviously the ecstasy wears off, but something of the experience stays with him. And he asks his girlfriend to marry him, and then they have a baby, and, you know, it's a nice, happy ending. <laughs> um, so, so the point is that I think, uh, I think there are some times when the experience of a mind-altering substance can teach us something. Um, but that's not the same, obviously, as being treated for a, for a depressive um, condition or disease or something like that. Um, and on the other hand, I think that the counterpoint to that point is that being in an altered state actually usually interferes with learning. If you're chronically blocked off emotionally, actually it's very difficult to learn how to deal with your emotions because you're not really experiencing them properly. So you're not developing other ways to, to manage emotions. I think like Professor Eklund was saying in his talk, um, that this is one of the real problems, I think, of our mass prescribing of antidepressants, that we're discouraging people from learning how to deal with the difficulties of life. So just to conclude on antidepressants, then I'll move on. Um, so if we were being honest about about antidepressants, this is what I think we'd say to people. At the moment, we are telling people that they have a chemical imbalance, that the antidepressant might correct their imbalance, or at the very least, we're saying um, you know, that the antidepressant will improve their depression with the implication that it's doing something in some sort of targeted way. If we were presenting antidepressants in a drug-centered way, we'd say, we've got these drugs, these are the sorts of alterations they produce. They make people a bit listless. They block your emotions. They'll, they'll dampen down your sex drive. Um, they might, if you're unlucky, make you quite agitated as well. Would you find, do you think you would find these effects helpful? That's what we should, that's how I think doctors should be presenting antidepressants if they're going to suggest them. 
So what about other sorts of drugs? Um, I want to talk about what we call antipsychotics for a moment now. Um, so as I mentioned, the first generation of antipsychotics were tried out um, in Paris by two French psychiatrists, and they were definitely regarded as special sorts of sedatives. These psychiatrists were very enthusiastic about them. They thought they were much better than the other sorts of sedatives that they had available. Um, but nevertheless, they thought they were a sedative sort of, of drug. Um, and we know... Uh, and we know from various volunteer studies, uh, as well as, in fact, descriptions by these uh, psychiatrists who used them back in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s, descriptions of, um, of patients, but also they took them themselves and they described what it, what it felt like to take these drugs themselves. Um, so from that sort of information, we know quite a lot about the sort of changes that these drugs produce. And also there have been animal studies looking at how they change animal behavior. And these studies are very consistent. They show that these drugs reduce movement, um, impair cognitive function, reduce your reaction times, uh, reduce your attention, um, impair your memory, reduce spontaneous activity. Um, Subjectively, people describe feeling uh, sedated and tired, but also emotionally flattened, <clears throat> lacking in initiative and motivation. There was a really interesting study done by um, a psychiatrist called David Healy, who some of you may have heard of, who's done a lot of interesting um, work on, on psychiatric drugs. Um, so he was working in a psychiatric hospital, and he randomized members of staff to have uh, a dose of um, an older generation antipsychotic called droperidol, or a dose of Valium or a placebo. And then um, a few hours later, they had to take part in these tests, neuropsychological tests. And people who took part in this um, in this experiment said that they could, they could do what was required of them in the test if they were told specifically what to do when, but they couldn't find the initiative to work it out for themselves. So one of them describes how he couldn't even get a sandwich out of a sandwich machine. He just couldn't work out how to put everything together. But if someone said, press that button, he could, he could do it. Uh, so, so this is um, this is a quote from that study. Um, so they all describe these feelings of disengagement, feeling sort of separated from from what what they were meant to be doing. Um, the this is one of the French psychiatrists Pierre Deneker who used these drugs early on, and he proposed that the what the early antipsychotics were doing was actually producing a mild form of Parkinson's disease, and they were basically replacing the psychosis or schizophrenia with Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease involves a reduction, a restriction of movement, but also of your emotional repertoire. Uh, and that's what he thought was really key, this emotional restriction, um, which caused people to lose interest in their psychotic symptoms. Uh, and in fact, that was quite a common observation at that time, that people still had delusions and psychotic experiences, but they weren't interested in them anymore. They weren't as preoccupied by them. So people who've, uh, who report the effects of these drugs on online forums describe similar sort of alterations. They describe feelings of mental and physical stagnance, for example, feeling emotionally em empty um, and feeling lethargy and emotional indifference. And I think, that, I think the effects of these drugs are really well summed up by uh, this person who took haloperidol for a psychotic episode. So she said, although I felt very well, I felt as if I had absolutely nothing to talk about. I kept wondering whatever it was that had been so interesting during most of my life that I had suddenly lost. But I was very much in contact with reality and for that I was thankful. So I think that quotation highlights really well how 
these emotion-dampening, restricting effects of these drugs can be helpful if you're really preoccupied by us, you know, lost in a psychotic world, and yet there's a heavy price to pay, and that price is your interest in life generally. This is uh, a picture by a cartoonist who I like, who calls herself Auntie Psychiatry, and um, so she's contrasting the lure of madness, the colourful side of the picture, with the greyness of of, of drug-induced normality, of antipsychotic-induced normality. Um, little Torpid, she's called it. And, and Oliver Sacks's brother, he, he was the, Oliver Sacks is the neurologist. He wrote some interesting books about neurological conditions. His brother had schizophrenia and was treated with antipsychotics, and he referred to the effects of antipsychotics as making him feel rottenly normal. Thought that was quite a good way of putting it. So I think when you see the effects of antipsychotics like that, when you understand um, the sorts of alterations they produce, you can see that they, can, that they could be useful in people who are undergoing a really severe acute psychotic episode, people whose mental lives have been taken over by delusional beliefs or hallucinations. Um, actually, having all that damped down a bit might be useful and might enable them to engage in the world a bit. But you can also immediately understand that, firstly, that experience is probably not pleasant. Even, even if it restores you to normal, it's not necessarily very nice. And secondly, that long-term, probably these drugs are going to impair your functioning. They're going to interfere with your motivation, um, and that's going to, to make functioning difficult. So therefore, taking them long-term the, uh, may have more disadvantages than, than benefits. The, the majority of research on long-term treatment has concluded that long-term antipsychotic treatment is much better than um, placebo treatment. So this is a, another recent meta-analysis um, of trials which show uh, that if you come off your antipsychotic treatment, you're much more likely to have a relapse than if you stay on it. Those are the blue columns. And you're more likely to go into hospital than if you stay on your treatment. The trouble is, there are various problems with these studies. The first problem is that they are all discontinuation studies. So they're not studies that have started people on long-term treatment. They're studies that are stopping people who are already on it. And we know, of course, that uh, if you've been on long-term treatment, it changes your body, changes your brain makeup. Therefore, if it's stopped, especially suddenly, there are likely to be adverse effects from stopping. Um, so to a certain extent, these studies may just be picking up the adverse effects of stopping medication. There's some evidence that stopping medication may precipitate an episode of uh, the underlying disorder, possibly because it's a shock to the system, a sort of additional stress. Um, this, is, this has been shown very conclusively with the use of lithium for manic depression or bipolar disorder. So there are several studies showing that your risk of having a relapse when you stop lithium is higher than it was before you started lithium. So there's something about coming off lithium that really increases your risk of having an episode. The other problem with these studies is that they are, again, short term, mostly less than a year, and yet people are treated for 10, 20, 30 years. And that they've mostly focused just on relapse rather than looking at how people are functioning overall or people's quality of life or other, other markers that may be important to people. And if you look at, um, if you look not at trials, but at long-term follow-ups of people who are diagnosed with psychosis or schizophrenia, what you see is that people who avoid taking long-term treatment do better than people who take long-term treatment. Um, so this shows you the percentage of people who are showing a recovery, the, the percentage of people diagnosed with schizophrenia who are showing a recovery is much higher among people who are not taking continuous antipsychotic treatment. 
Now, one of the problems with this sort of research is that the people who avoid taking continuous long-term treatment are probably, at least some of them, people who have a less severe condition in the first place. And the people who end up on long-term treatment are likely to be the people who have the most serious problems. So the results, the outcome, is partly a consequence of features of the underlying disorder. Nevertheless, this does raise questions about... Um, about whether drug treatment might in itself make outcomes worse. And recently there was a long-term follow-up of a randomised discontinuation study that suggested that is the case, that suggested that in the long term people are more likely to make a recovery if they've at least had a go at discontinuing their medication. So this this study compared people who were on long-term maintenance treatment with people who had a gradual reduction of their antipsychotic treatment with their doctor um, in a sort of very flexible way. Um, and after the, uh, after the, and, and they had an 18-month follow-up, uh, which showed that there were higher rates of relapses no particular benefits to discontinuation. It was just reported as yet another trial that shows that maintenance treatment is the right thing to do. But they did a seven-year follow-up, and at the seven-year follow-up, they found that the people who were randomized to uh, the discontinuation arm of the study were twice as likely to show a full social recovery as the people who were randomized to maintenance. Now, not all those people discontinued their medication completely. This was a trial of a, an attempt at reduction in a very sort of natural clinical setting. Um, but what it shows is that attempting to reduce medication seemed to produce better outcomes in terms of functioning. But the other thing it showed is that although people were slightly more likely to have a relapse early on, if they were in the discontinuation arm, by, by seven years, the relapses had evened out between the two groups, so there was no advantage by seven years. Um, one explanation for these long-term results may be the increasing data that we have that shows that antipsychotics do adversely affect the brain. There, um, there are, that there's data from a number of different sources now showing that long-term antipsychotic treatment reduces brain volume. Uh, and the most convincing of these studies are two animal studies, one done with macaque monkeys, which showed that the, um, that the monkeys who's, who had been treated with the antipsychotics, their brains were around about 10% lighter than monkeys who'd been treated with a placebo injection. Um, and there was a rat study that showed something similar. Uh, and similarly, if you follow up patients who are on antipsychotics and scan their brains, what you show is that those who are exposed to the most, the highest levels of antipsychotics show the greatest degree of brain volume loss. We all lose brain uh, uh, tissue as we get older, but what these studies are showing is that people who are on long-term antipsychotics are losing it at a higher rate than people who are not taking them, and people who are on higher doses for longer periods are losing them at the highest rate. Um, so, so what I think that shows about antipsychotics is that they may well be useful for the treatment of people who have acute, serious psychotic episodes, some people can get those through those without antipsychotics, but I think for some people it is the right thing to do to use drug treatment. But long-term antipsychotics have lots of uh, disadvantages. There are lots of other adverse effects. You know, people drop down dead of heart conditions, um, get put on weight and get diabetes and, uh, and things like that, uh, as well as the brain volume reduction. So it seems to me that we've got to avoid them if we can, and we need better evidence about the pros and cons of long-term treatment. So I've, been, uh, I've started doing, I've been doing this for a couple of years now, a study called the RADAR trial, which is uh, an attempt to replicate the, the, um, the Dutch study by Lex Wondering, that one. Um, but we're, we're doing it in a wider group of people, 
we've got a two-year follow-up initially, but hopefully we'll, we'll get longer follow-up after that. And we're looking at social functioning as well as relapse and symptoms and neuropsychological performance. Um, and I, I'm just mentioning this really because I want to say it's been funded by the British government, by the research arm of the National Health Service. So it's not just me that's saying this is a concern. There are lots of people starting to think, actually, these drugs are really um, have some really serious adverse effects. We really need to be clear about whether long-term treatment is a, is a good or a bad thing. Uh, and that's just how the, the trial is going to look. Um, so I've almost finished, because you've been sitting here for a long time. I'll just say a couple of words about bipolar disorder. Um, so, so bipolar disorder, uh, we used to call manic depression, um, and the, the drugs that are uh, regarded as specific drugs for manic depression or bipolar disorder are all neurosuppressants or neurosedatives of one sort or another. Um, so the ones you might be familiar with are lithium. Um, various anti-epileptic drugs have made their way into treatment for bipolar disorder through uh, various convoluted routes. And antipsychotics have become uh, a, a major treatment for bipolar disorder too nowadays. Um, because they're sedative neurosuppressant type drugs, it's uh, very likely, and the trials show, that they reduce the symptoms of acute mania. When someone's really manic, really aroused, running around all over the place, not sleeping at all, giving them a sedative substance, not surprisingly, helps them to calm down reduces, and reduces the duration of their mania. Um, now, there were, there are, again, lots of discontinuation studies suggesting that these drugs can also prevent the recurrence of an episode of manic depression. But as I said earlier, they're, they're flawed by the fact that they're discontinuation studies. And certainly for lithium, there's very good evidence that actually uh, when you come off lithium, your, your risk of having a relapse is unnaturally raised. It's raised above what it would be anyway. So to my mind, there's still a question mark about whether these drugs really do help prevent the recurrence of manic depressive episodes. Um, I can't see any logical reason why these drugs would really help with depression other than, uh, I guess, drugs like antipsychotics, as I've been saying, suppress emotions, and some people may, may find that sort of effect useful. Um, and uh, there's no evidence, this is important, that they reduce mood variability, no evidence at all. There have been a couple of studies of lithium, and it doesn't, doesn't do that. Um, and this is important because our concept of bipolar disorder has expanded recently um, so that uh, it used to be, manic depression used to be a very rare syndrome um, that consisted of people having really very dramatic manic episodes that would almost always end them up in hospital, land them in hospital. Um, whereas now there is this idea that there is a whole spectrum of bipolar conditions and that people who have mood fluctuations can be thought of as having a bipolar condition. Um, and people like this are getting started on bipolar drugs. Uh, and these drugs, you know, they include antipsychotics. These drugs have serious adverse effects. They've never been tested in people who have the sort of wider version of bipolar disorder. They're all tested in people who have the classical form of manic depression. Um, and they've not been shown to help mood variability. So I think these drugs are currently being prescribed to a lot of people really on false pretenses. Um, I think a lot of people think they're taking them for one thing, but actually they've been tested for a quite separate thing. And, you know, the, the, there was a story, in fact, um, in the Times newspaper in the UK by a journalist who, uh, who thought he had bipolar disorder. He read up a lot on the internet and he went to his doctor and persuaded him that he did have bipolar disorder. He said, he, you know, he exaggerated a few little things, but, you know... Um, it told him he'd been partying a lot and up at night and couldn't sleep, was given a diagnosis and was put on a medication for bipolar disorder. And then he finally, four years later, decided, actually, I better get myself off this medication, got himself off, and he said it was like waking up out of four years of just being asleep. Um, and, you know, he just couldn't believe how he'd lost four years of his life. 
uh, and looking back on it with a bit more perspective, he felt that actually, yes, he was having a difficult time, but not, but not that he had bipolar disorder at all. So this just last few slides. So, <clears throat> so what I'm trying to say is that we need to understand the drugs that are prescribed for mental disorders differently. We need to understand them as psychoactive substances that alter normal states of the brain and mental functioning. Um, and that we've been misled into understanding them as disease treatments. We've been misled by this disease-centered model, which has obscured the fact that they are mind-altering substances. Why is this so? I think a number of influences have come together, a number of interests have come together um, to bolster and promote this disease-centered way of thinking about drug treatment. Um, professional interests, the psychiatric profession, have wanted to be able to present their treatments as medical treatments um, for a long time. It was part of their uh, campaign to, um, you know, to become the preeminent profession. Um, and then it became particularly important during the 1960s when the recreational drug scene got going. So I didn't know until recently, but the recreational drug scene really gets going with the diversion of prescription substances. In 1970, in America, one in five people is prescribed an amphetamine. The rates of prescribing of amphetamines were absolutely enormous. Um, and so it was very important for psychiatrists in particular to distance themselves from that issue um, as recreational drugs, drug use started to take off and get a bad name. Uh, so they, that's one strong reason <clears throat> why I think they had to start thinking of their treatments as disease targeting. Um, the pharmaceutical industry, of course, have made a lot of money out of uh, promoting their drugs for all sorts of disorders. They did quite well using a drug-centered model in the early days, as I showed you with those, uh, those advertisements from the mid-20th century. But then the benzodiazepine crisis happened in the 1980s, um, where, uh, in which it became apparent that benzodiazepines like Valium and Librium had been widely prescribed to people really just to keep them quiet, to people who were having life problems to keep them quiet. Um, and uh, that scandal was part of the scandal, was also the scandal that their withdrawal effects had been covered up. But the fact that they'd been so widely prescribed um, and, and been prescribed because of their mind-altering effects was part of the scandal. So in the, 90, in the 1990s, when Prozac and the new generation of, an, of antidepressants come along, the pharmaceutical industry have to market them as something different. It's no longer okay to tell people, we've got this drug, it's gonna get you a bit out of your head, and that might help you a bit. That's no longer okay. You have to tell people you have a disease and you need to take this to correct your disease. Um, and you can see how effective this marketing can be, I think, with this advertisement for Zyprexa. So Zyprexa is an antipsychotic that makes people gain an enormous amount of weight. And it's immediately obvious if someone's on Zyprexa and put on weight that they, they've taken a chemical that's altered their bodily function. Um, but this, way, this, this uh, advertisement says antipsychotic medicines are believed to work by balancing the chemicals found naturally in the brain. So it makes it sound like almost like a homeopathic substance, as if it's completely innocuous. And this sort of marketing even enabled these substances to be marketed to, you know, for the use in young children, um, for example, in this advert from 2004. Uh, and this was all part of the early intervention movement, which was partly funded by pharma to try and um, increase prescribing in young people. But I don't think any of these things would have worked if there hadn't been political um, support, really, for this whole project, political support for the idea that uh, life problems are medical problems and can, there's a quick fix in the form of a, of a drug treatment. Um, that's been a... It's a politically expedient idea, especially at times of great, tr um, great tr uh, change, social change, um, and you know events like 
uh, the recent economic crisis. So, I've just got a few concluding words. I think I've already said all that, and I'm going to stop because I'd like to take a few questions maybe directly after the talk, if that's all right. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that's been useful. Should I take a few questions? <clears throat> work so um, you're opening up for a few questions so so we will change the agenda the plan a little and uh, so people may now ask a few questions and then afterwards when we have the break you can also write questions so yes. first let's see if anyone has a quick question or two um, I have been told that uh, the effect of Ritalin for uh, ADHD or uh, ADD in grown-ups is that it uh, increases the level of dopamine, so uh, that uh, sharpens uh, uh, the attention. If you don't have uh, the dopamine, you seek... Uh, no, I'm talking about ADD, not, not, not the hyperactivity. So... Uh, you, you are not so tempted uh, uh, all the time to, to find uh, things that are satisfying and, uh, you know, eat uh, good things or go, go on looking at Facebook and so on. So it's easier to, to keep the concentration on doing what you should do. What do you think about yeah, that? So, so Ritalin is a stimulant, like amphetamines, and... Um, what what is so we used to talk about there being a paradoxical effect of stimulants whereby they stimulate people who take them for recreational purposes or you know normal people get stimulated um, kids with hyperactivity disorder get calmed down by them and there was this idea that they work differently in people who have the disorder and people who don't that's not true what what is happening when they are given to people with ADD or ADHD is that you're giving a very low dose. And if you give a low dose of stimulants to animals or humans with no diagnosis, what you find is that their attention improves. Like if you have a cigarette or a glass of coffee, you know, a mug of coffee. Um, low dose stimulants improve attention, focus people and actually calm people down cal and calm animals down. Um, so... And, and they do affect dopamine, uh, but they also affect noradrenaline. They affect all, all sorts of neurotransmitters, but actually they're probably their main effects are on noradrenaline rather than dopamine. Um, so so that, that's how I think they're working in, in um, attention deficit disorder. I think it's a low-dose effect uh, that, that actually occurs in anyone, but, but maybe is particularly useful if, you know, if people have got particular problems with attention and concentration. Uh, how do you think uh, the psychiatric world will look like in 30 years? <laughs> uh, that's a good question and probably probably one I should leave for uh, our discussion our discussion later. Um, uh, all I would say is I, I was sort of hopeful, you know, I showed you those newspaper headlines. I was sort of hopeful that things were changing uh, a few years ago, but I'm, I'm not so hopeful anymore. <laughs> I think, I think the problem is there's so much invested in our current way of seeing things. Um, and particularly, as I started my talk by talking about, um, you know, Thomas Saz's quote, Henry Maudsley's quote, we particularly have an investment in medicalizing the social control of disruptive behavior. Because if we take away that medical uh, framework we're left with some really tricky political problems. You know, how do we 
How do we manage someone whose behavior is really erratic, possibly dangerous, but actually they're too confused to put in front of a, of a judge or to go through criminal proceedings? You know, that, that is a difficult question. And, and I think governments have just avoided it by saying it's medical. Um, but, I, but I, yeah, and I, I can't see much will for, for trying to grasp it. There was a move, actually, there was a move probably 20 years ago now in the UK to, there was some interest in bringing in capacity-based legislation. So that was the idea that you didn't have to have a mental disorder. It was just really based on your level of understanding. And if your level of, you know, if, you're, if you were so confused that you were not really able to make, you know, reasoned decisions. I mean, of course, all these are very subjective terms, but... Um, the idea was that it would be about your reasoning ability and your capacity rather than this idea that you have an underlying disease or disorder. That, that did seem to me to be uh, progress, and there was interest in it. I expect it will come back at some point. Okay, so one final question before we take a break. Uh, thank you. Um, the knowledge of this, of course, has been known to some people a very long time, to the people using these drugs, and it's basically been screamed. Um, it's really, really good that, you know, to get the confirmation on it somehow. But you had a, you had a picture up there of the Mental Health Act. Um, and my, I don't know how to put this in a question, but w what I experienced from the last 10, 15 years, while this information has become more and more widely known and recognized somehow, uh, even, the, even though there is a long way to go before it's actually getting a consequence, uh, that goes for the people with mild disorders, you know, the people that are boxed in, you know, not having too big problems. Um, that is a problem that is overused. But the people who are forcefully medicated with exactly the same drugs, we kind of, not we, uh, some, <laughs> the, you, <laughs> not you, but <laughs> keep, keep them, you know, that they should still have them. They're not good for the general population, they're not good for the people who don't have too big problems, but still with the same, uh, you know, with this evidence, it's so totally unacceptable to continue to forcefully medicate people. And I kind of, I, I would wish that also the people who deal with the science would emphasize this stronger. That's a really good point. Um, so I, I mean, I, I do work in a, I have worked in, I still work in a service with some people who've got really serious problems. And I, I personally believe we have to have some system that is going to contain people who are behaving very erratically, really, really not making logical judgments and can be dangerous for those reasons. Um, and maybe sometimes that uh, could involve the use of drugs. I think if we did it honestly, then we'd have to put in an awful lot more scrutiny. There'd have to be legal controls. Um, Henry Maudsley is actually suggesting way back at the beginning of the 20th century that there should be judges involved in, in the decisions to medicate people, that, that that should go to a tribunal or, or some sort of legal um, authority. It shouldn't be a medical decision. Um, so I think, I think there could be ways of using, of using forced medication that would be fairer and more transparent and better scrutinized. And I think there are probably some situations, I think, where, where that is necessary. When I, you know, when I've seen people who are really, really disturbed, I feel that probably that, I don't know, the, the other option is that they're locked in a padded cell for a very, very long time, and that doesn't seem very nice either. Although, although there was a very interesting German study which um, asked people after they'd been discharged from hospital whether they preferred um, chemical sedation or, or physical restraint. And most people said they preferred physical restraint. Yeah. So in the short term, certainly, I think that might be 
that might be preferable. But I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to that and to that gentleman's question. Okay, thank you. Sorry for going off, <laughs> going off the programme a bit. <laughs> So thank you very much, Joanna, for your presentation. And we will now have a 20-minute break. And if you want to write um, questions, you are free to do so. And you can now collect your book.
Bruker hun den, eller? Nei. Det er min, det er.
Da er det fint om dere inntar plassen igjen. Nå skal vi jo ha en samtale her oppe på, eller her nede, rett sagt, nærmest på scenen. Det er så mange av dere som sitter så veldig langt unna. Dere har ikke lyst til å komme litt nærmere så dere ser ansiktene på de som snakker her fremme. Veldig hyggelig om dere rykker litt nærmere noen av dere. Rampen sitter alltid bak, sier Einar Plyn. Det er derfor du sitter foran. Så vi er nå going to have a conversation between our prominent guest, our Brexit guest fra England, med en prominent norwegian psykiatrist. Det er Magnus Hall. He comes uh, down today from Tromsø. He's a psychiatrist, chief medical officer at what is called Psykisk helse- og rusklinikken ved Universitetssykehuset i Nord-Norge. He was also the boss of the clinic there until recently. And he has uh, been a pioneer, among other things, in introducing a, a drug-free uh, treatment unit. So first, uh, maybe the two of you have some comments to things that have been said earlier today. Perhaps I should give the word to you first, Magnus. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, I will have to correct your introduction. Okay. Uh, I'm no longer uh, uh, director of, this, of, the, uh, of psychiatry or mental health and drug abuse at the, at the university hospital. I quit that job three months ago, basically because I'm a little reluctant about the direction of the development of the mental health care. Uh, so uh, now I work as a, as a psychiatrist and I try to work in an acute ward and also with the drug-free program. So that's uh, my position these days. So that was just a little uh, okay. uh, refreshing. Oh, okay. So uh, to me, uh, Joanna, you had a very, what should I say, full and... Uh, and uh, an impressive presentation uh, and uh, I have uh, read uh, your books and I have uh, been following the development in in what you have been talking about over the years and uh, and uh, it seems to me that that this has also uh, that this also is a position that very many others will uh, uh, buys into in many different ways and still we have a uh, a different development within the field of mental health. So uh, the question is, and, and there are very strong forces. Like you know, uh, our colleague, Peter Goetsche, who has been very critical of uh, psychiatric drugs. He was just expelled from the board of Cochrane. Uh, and uh, there's now a very big debate and a very big, uh, because of that. But it seems that we are, in many perspectives, up against very strong forces. So, uh, and, and I think we have to face this on very many different levels because when you work in, for instance, in Norwegian psychiatry, there is a certain framework that you have to work within. So, like when you, at the end here before, said that, well, we have to use force in psychiatry in certain uh, instances, I think this also has to do with with the, the construction of a system that when you know problems are presented, they are presented in a ways where it's very difficult to see other possibilities. But there might be a possibility to present things somewhat differently. And I also think that in some respect, there is a development in that direction within parts of the field, but parts of the field also moves in a very different direction. For instance, I think here in Norway now, there are two very strong, uh, what should I call it, position that's, that's, uh, that has got political support in a way. And one, the one position is, you know, uh, that we have to develop the patient's healthcare system. The, this healthcare system is not for the professionals, like many professionals have seemed to think, but it's for the patients. So... We shouldn't do anything without talking to the patients. And the patients should, you know, give the premises for what is good practice, also in the field of psychiatry. 
So we have to listen to the, to the um, consumers or the patients or, or whatever people want to be called. Uh, and I think the reason we have got this drug-free drive in Norway is the consumers. It has nothing to do with the professionals. The professionals, uh, at least many things, seems to think that this is, this is uh, uh, practice without the knowledge base, like one of the professors said in the, in the medical journal. Or, it's, uh, the, or the health minister is ir irresponsible. He's not listening to the professionals. He's listening to someone else that he shouldn't listen to. So this is, a, this is one drive in this country, and the other direction is a very medical drive. And I think uh, the, we are now, uh, in, in Norway now, uh, so-called treatment packages, or packages both for evaluation and treatment of psychiatric illnesses or diseases is being introduced. And to get help in mental health care in the future, you will have to buy into treatment packages. And I think this is, uh, this is driving, uh, driving the field in a very medical direction because uh, the goal of the treatment package, the first one will be introduced 1st of January next year, and the first one is an evaluation package. And when you apply this package, you will have to uh, translate the patient's problems into medical terms. And the patient will have to buy into this. If the patient doesn't buy into the medical description of his problems or her problems, then he will not be able to get help. So you this need is like managed care in the in US. One way, yes, in one yeah, way. Yeah. You have to so you have agree to have that diagnosis. you have to have a diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. As if the diagnosis was yeah, yeah. you know, uh, showing some kind of disease in mm -hmm. a way. And yeah. we all know that the diagnosis in psychiatry is just a classificatory mm -hmm. system. It doesn't really... It doesn't really uh, show a disease, although there was an idea or mm. when it was introduced, the current version back in, in, in 1980, that there is some underlying uh, malfunction in the individual that manifests itself with symptoms, so, and, then, and that we eventually, by treating clusters of symptoms as diseases, we will find the underlying malfunctioning disease. And we're still looking for it. We've been, when I started in, in mental health in 1974, I heard that, you know, uh, there's going on a lot of research on the, on the central nervous system, and it just, it's just a short time now, and we'll find the answer. And you still hear the same thing. It's just, you know, it's, <laughs> we're right on the threshold of finding the answer for mental health problems. Uh, by, uh, you know, brain research. So I think these two different drives in Norwegian psychiatry, at least, I don't know how international they are, but at least in Norway, this is very central, and I think that uh, we, in one way, will have to decide, because it's not possible, in my opinion, it's not possible to, to ride these two horses at the same time. We have to decide which way to go. And I think there's Norwegian psychiatrist, Trond Eure, he's written a very nice book, uh, this year, that's called uh, a, less, um, a less medical psychiatry, minder medicinsk psychiatry, den vi anbefaler. It's something along these lines he also writes. Maybe not completely similar, but something along that. And, uh, so I think, so these were just some of the thoughts I had after, after your presentation. Yeah, no, that's really interesting to hear about the situation here. Um, so we have the same the same sorts of movements, although in different in different terms in the UK. And what I would say the main limitations are there are the economic um, resource constraints, which means that uh, people are only being admitted to hospital for very short periods of time. And in order to do that, and to get them out of hospital quickly, they're obviously being heavily medicated. Um, so that, to me, makes it very difficult to uh, take anyone's wishes into consideration um, or to try and practice in a more humanistic, um, patient-focused way. Um, 
it certainly makes it impossible for anyone to be able to recover from a condition naturally without, without having a considerable amount of drug treatment. And then the other thing that happens is people get discharged into the community on high levels of medication, um, and then that medication doesn't get, you know, they just get left on it. It doesn't get reviewed mm. regularly or adjusted. Um, so, so, I, so, so to me, that's, that, that's one of the major constraints that's happening in the UK at the moment. Um, we, we have a patient movement, obviously a service user movement, but it, it has different arms. So there are some people within that movement who like, you know, like the idea of diagnosis and, and treatment and, uh, um, you know, have have interests that are aligned to some extent with with biological psychiatrists and pharma. Um, and then there are other people within that movement who've been advocating for soteria type facilities, mm. you know, drug, which, which essentially is drug free treatment um, type facilities. So there are different elements, but it, it, it maybe isn't quite so obviously divided as you describe it here. Mm. Um. Well, maybe that's only my perception, but my perception is that it's that that there are different mm. directions mm. at the same time. Yeah, no, I'm sure that's true. And, and it seems also that that uh, uh, I mean, it's it's difficult to understand why this enormous amount of uh, psychiatry critical literature is not making more of an impression. When you listen to Aina, for example, how many how many books do you sell? Well, not much. No, that's why we have it. We're giving it away free. Yeah, because <laughs> so reach more readers. So so what what can we do to really raise the debate? I mean, it's uh, it's amazing to me that this book that I mentioned by Trunoide that it hasn't raised the debate in Norway. Mm -hmm. You hardly mm -hmm. see any, anyone mm -hmm. commenting on it. So it's uh, it's something that's it's uh, it's difficult to see how how it's possible to move forward in one way in this yeah. situation. But at the same time, you can see uh, you have the possibility, of course, in your own practical field. There is a possibility. When I meet one patient, I have the possibility to say that this drug here, it might help you to get rid of some of these symptoms, but it more, might also change your brain uh, in a permanent way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that, so, uh, so maybe that would be one direction to go in to say that we should have more clear uh, ideas about what kind of information we should give to patients when it comes to drugs. Yes, yes, I think that's, that's a good point. So maybe that, but yeah. that could be one thing to yeah. do, to create yeah. more, uh, to create more uh, information about the different effects of drugs, uh, the way the, the drugs work on, uh, on the body. Yeah. I've, I've wanted to create some sort of drug-centered leaflets about different, different medications for a while. Um, uh, in, yeah, in order to present present them in the sort of way that you're saying, I think that would but be you good thing to do. That. Not, no, huh. no, I haven't really got round to it. You're almost <laughs> done it with a little. I've with done a it book. in book forms. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. I suppose so. But not as you know, I think it would be yeah. useful to have leaflets too. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I do think from my experience in the UK that all that pharma publicity in the 1990s really did start to sort of get under people's skin and and. Um, you know, the health service is overwhelmed by people who are experiencing social hardship, you know, who are about to lose their home um, or their job or, you know, their children's involved with street gangs. or You know, they've got all sorts of reasons to be really depressed and stressed and unhappy. Um, and we have been telling, you know, the psychiatric profession and the pharmaceutical industry have been telling them for years and years that they should think of this as a disease and go and see their doctor. And I, I, I think that message has got through so strongly. It's, we need to reverse that. Um, yeah. Because I think that's just such an unhelpful way for, you know, it, it, well, it's just not, it's not true that the doctor has any answers. That's, mm. that's the main, that's the main um, problem with that. That yeah. situation. Would you? Okay, we have some questions from uh, from the audience. So, if you are ready for it, here comes the first one. My friend, 
58 years, is today in a mental ward with forced medication with anti-psychotic uh, drugs. He started uh, that when he was 28 years. After 25 years on these pills, he wanted to get off. He has tried five to six times, but he does, doesn't make it. He gets very ill. Is he addicted to these pills, or why can't he get off? So, um, so that's a not uncommon situation. I don't know who, who asked that question. I don't know if you want to. Hi. <laughs> so that's a not uncommon situation. Um, and there are many reasons why this person might not be, why your friend might, may not be able to get off the drugs. So, uh, so one possibility, I was talking to someone earlier, um, is that the medication has permanently changed his brain and therefore every time he tries to come off um, all the, um, uh, the, the, the he, he will have grown, for example, more dopamine receptors if he's on antipsychotic drugs and probably lots of other receptors that have been suppressed as well. And so when he reduces the medication, they start all firing off and that may precipitate you know, another psychotic episode. So that is a possibility. Um, but it is possible as well that they are suppressing something that is continuously there, and when you take the lid off, it, it comes out again. Um, you know, I think I've, I've been looking through the records of my local mental hospital recently, and they said um, from 100 years ago, it's difficult to know what was going on for people then, obviously, but it does suggest that there were some people who did seem to get into a permanent sort of psychotic state, and didn't come out of it. Um, so, so, so uh, you know, so I think both of those things are possible, and it's, it's difficult to tell. And I presume he's tried to do this, you know, slowly and gradually, because obviously that's the main thing. I was also saying to someone earlier that, um, you know, I, I, I have come to the conclusion that I think in some cases they do alter the brain permanently, and therefore actually trying to get off them completely if you've been on them for a long time may just not be possible for some people. And it may be, pos may be better to aim to get to a low dose um, and, and stick at that, and maybe that could be reduced even further um, than trying to come off them altogether. Sometimes that, you know, that, that, uh, certainly that's worked for some, some of my patients. I would also th yes, think please, that, yeah. uh, that, uh, that there's a lot of evidence that you become more psychosis prone from using drugs. And also when it comes to tapering downs or, or withdrawing from uh, psychotropic drugs, there's not very much science. I mean, uh, the field has not been very occupied with finding out how to do this in a good and safe way. Because when we now have tr tried uh, to develop uh, drug-free treatment programs, we have tried to mm. check the literature on this, and, and we don't find any, uh, except some things that's been developed by people that have used the drugs themselves. So there are quite a lot of experiences from people that have used the drugs, but not the kind of scientific evidence that you often look for in medicine. So uh, it's, I think it's important to see if it's possible to get more scientific evidence of, of how to safely uh, get off psychotropic drugs, mm -hmm. drugs and especially neuroleptics. Uh, and uh, and uh, so I think uh, uh, we all be, it's not only getting off the drugs, that, but it's also are there things that you should or should not or could or could not do instead? Mm -hmm. Because... Uh, it's difficult to take other things the same way through your mouth that you take drugs. I mean, you can't prescribe things in medicine uh, the same way that you prescribe drugs. There's something with prescribing drugs that's very, that's very medical, so to speak. So, it's, so what can you do instead? Uh, I mean, you say that if you work, for instance, recovery-oriented, how could that be done in a tapering down situation in the best way? So there are very many sides to this. And also, uh, there are drugs, they are, uh, they are not made for tapering down. They're made, they're, they're, you know, they're capsules or they're, 
you have to use a hammer to, to get a smaller piece if you want to gradually reduce. So it's, it's not very easy to, to find good ways to do this. And it seems also that, that it's very individual how people react when they try to taper down. Mm -hmm. So that's at least the experience that we have done with the drug-free treatment unit is, you know, like, it's like when you go from four milligrams to three milligrams, Haldol, something happens if, that hap if you do that in just half a year. You have to do it in one year. Then maybe it's possible in a different way. Mm. Yes, thank you, both of you. I think you... The next question is related to the first one, actually, uh, because as you say, this is the kind of knowledge that the pharmaceutical industry is not very interested in exploring. And here comes the next question. Are there examples of screening of brains of people before and after treatment with neuroleptics? That's a quite fascinating question, I think. Um. I don't know any certain. No, I don't think so. There, there are, there are some, um, th there are some screen, uh, some MRI studies on people who haven't taken neuroleptics, um, uh, which have which have shown some differences, some slightly smaller brains in people who then um, who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia than people who don't. Um, before they've taken drug treatment, um, and slightly bigger brain cavities. I think there are, but there are many confounding factors that probably haven't been controlled well in those studies, like um, IQ, uh, class, exercise, you know, all sorts, sorts of other things that may influence brain size. But I don't know any that have sort of done, done a study just before someone started taking them and then followed them up after they've taken them. Okay, Moinus, do you have any comments no. on that? No. Okay, so now we jump to another theme. What do you think about uh, the recent re-emergence of research on the use of psychedelics in the treatment of mental disorders? Uh, that's an interesting, interesting question. So we've had some... Um, there's a lot of interest in the UK, and we've had some debate within the Critical Psychiatry Network about it. Um, and uh, so my feeling is, as I said about when I mentioned the Gary Greenberg book, that, uh, that it is possible sometimes for people to have drug-induced experiences and to learn from them. Um, but... Uh, but I'm not, not sure that that translates easily into a form of therapy. Um, so so one, of the, one of the ideas, one of the sort of types of research is involves giving people psychedelic drugs and then doing psychotherapy with them. Um, I suppose the, the idea is the psychedelic sort of provokes um, uh, memories and sort of breaks down inhibitions a bit. So, I, I mean, I suppose my feeling about that is some people might find that useful. It wouldn't be for me. <laughs> but, you know, there might be some people who might find that idea, you know, helpful. But I think it's very important that it's acknowledged for what it is. It, some of the research that's being done in the UK is being done in a quite a disease-centred sort of framework. So the idea is, you know, that uh, LSD works on serotonin, maybe therefore because... They're still assuming that serotonin is involved in depression. Maybe, therefore, it's going to, um, you know, reverse the depression. And that, I think, is, is, is not helpful. Probably, I mean, uh, all psychoactive substances, you could think about that it's possible to use them in a meaningful way. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think often there are also other possibilities. For instance, in this case, meditation seems to be... Mm something that can induce the same, uh, what, what you call it, status as, a, as some of these drugs. It seems like. At least that's what is being described in literature. Mm. Mm. Yes. Oh, okay, here comes a quite different uh, question. 
if I manage to get it right, given the significance attributed to RCTS, also this randomized controlled studies, uh, which all target what is defined as the effect of a chemical, and given the arbitrariness of the distinction between effect and side effects. How can such studies still be defendable, acceptable? Um, I'm not sure that I totally understand the question. So, does, does whoever asked it want to want to express it? Yes. Yes. Mm. We all the time keep the illusion that there is one thing which we call the effect. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. The rest, yeah. The yeah. rest is what we don't want. Yeah, yeah. Our side effects. Yes. And this differentiation is totally arbitrary. It's just because it's much easier to start from one point, one entity, one effect, and then whatever, get out the box rest. But if we put this into the design of RCTs, it becomes So I, I've thought about this a lot. I think that's a really good point. Um, but I'm not sure that I would agree with you. Okay, so if you wanted to see whether a dose of Valium sent you to sleep or um, sent you to sleep faster or calmed down someone who was, you know, running around a ward smashing windows or something, I, I think that is something you could measure in an RCT. Um, it, it's always going to be a bit crude because you don't have to decide. Do you know what? One early randomized control trial of antipsychotics, their outcome measure was how many windows were smashed. That was actually their outcome. So I, I, I think you, and it's fairly easy to measure <coughs> sleep latency, how long it takes you to get to sleep. So I think there are some things that you can, you know, some measurable effects of, of drugs that you can measure. They're not necessarily... I mean, I mean, your point about whether it's a therapeutic or a side eff effect is uh, completely accept that. Um, you know, the therapeutic effect is just the effect we want or we like. We've just selected that out arbitrarily from, um, from the global effects of a drug, and it may be... Uh, you know, that we like that, but all, you know, the other things that the drug are doing actually outweigh any benefits it might have. That's, you know, you might find you get to sleep earlier on your Valium, but actually, you know, you can't get out, up for hours the next morning, so actually it's not much use. No. But I still think that we could, there are some things we could test out in a, 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 in a trial. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, no, that, yeah. sorry, that's a really good point, yes. So we're looking at, we need to look at the global effects of drugs, absolutely, I agree with you. And yeah. complexity. And, and complexity and duration, that, you know, doing studies that, that last for years and years and years, you know, because in theory, you might give someone one dose of drug and something might still happen five years down the line, even if they're not, you know, don't take it again. So really, you want long-term follow-up for everything. Yeah, 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 no, I agree. That's why I, I um, wonder how long will this so last until we have dismantled the illusion of the solidity of the RCTs because <coughs> they are a complete illusion. If you put it into an equation, there is only one factor which you are interested in. Mm -hmm. The 17 others yeah. have also changed because yeah, nothing yeah. is unchanged. Yeah. Yeah. It's so fragile, the whole system. Yeah. I wonder, how long can it last? So, I mean, I think one of the reasons we are, as you say, hung up on randomised control trials is that we, uh, as a society, but, you know, doctors are particularly guilty, do have a rose-tinted view of the effects of our drugs. We, want, we don't really want to hear the bad news. Um, so we focus on short-term studies that you know, look at a relatively narrow range of effects so we can say, oh, look at this. And then we pay much less attention to 
all the bad things that happen down the line. And occasionally these come out and there are big scandals and things are taken off the market, uh, you know, that because there is post-drug marketing. Um, it's not very systematic. No one really bothers to pay for it. But there is a certain amount, you know, a certain amount of it does go on. Um, so, yes, it's, it's really about... We need to tip the balance back, don't we? We, we you know, my view is... You know, a drug is harmful until proven otherwise, really. Um, except that, having said that, there may be some situations that are, you know, so devastating in themselves, you might be prepared to put up with that uncertainty. But nevertheless, that's, that's the principle that we should be going by. And we need to put a lot more attention into working out what long-term effects these drugs are having, yeah. Yes, yes. And if we don't tolerate that as a profession, I'm in a profession, then we should try to find something else to do. I mean, nobody is forced to be in medicine. And nobody is forced to defend the system. If it's too uncomfortable to take the consequences, I can become something else. Others blame on me, but still. <laughs> Oh, I think that was good. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's yep. a good point. <laughs> it's, I, I mean, you know, as a psychiatrist, there are many times when I feel very uncomfortable about uh, my work. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, it relates to a point that Magnus was making earlier. Um, you know, it, it's very difficult often, and you would probably relate to, to work... In a, in a system that is sort of geared up towards medicating people and keeping people quiet in, way, in different ways because everyone around you is, you know, has a sort of different agenda. Um, so you do the little things that you can, but often it doesn't feel like very much. Yeah. Do very much, actually. Well, OK, exactly. I think you need a <laughs> microphone if you're going to say more because not everyone can hear you. Sorry. Okay, so if there are more comments from the audience, we will have the microphone out. Sorry. Okay, here comes a double question. What is the best treatment for depression and what is the best treatment for trauma? Do you want to have a go? I feel I've been yeah, talking well, a lot. I think you, it's, you uh, <laughs> it's in one way... Uh, <laughs> very difficult question because you have to then address what what is meant by depression here mm -hmm. and what is meant by trauma here um, yeah. yeah so that's yeah. I mean because if you if you look at people that have been traumatized uh, for instance people that have been serially seriously traumatized in early childhood uh, they will generally have a a uh, much bigger risk of being diagnosed with different kind of psychiatric problems later in life. Uh, so that might then uh, lead to different uh, answers to a question, what is a good treatment? Uh, and also when it comes to, to depression, what, when you talked about depression, I mean, in, in the 1930s, 1% 1 of the population was depressed and the depression at that time tended to go over by itself unless you died from it, uh, which also m might happen, but I mean, generally it would, it would end. Today, I mean, over the lifetime, 20% will be depressed. Uh, and so that must be a different kind of depression. So which depression do we treat here? Um, it's difficult to say. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's also so, and it, and it also, <clears throat> uh, the point that I made, I think I made earlier, that uh, we, the diagnosis, they kind of, uh, they're very well shaped to, to make uh, research on treatment programs. So there has been a lot, of, made a lot of research on treatment of depression with, uh, with different kind of behavioral treatments. And some of them proved better than other treatments, which might actually be a result of very many different things. So it's not, it's not uh, uh, 
So therefore, I cannot say that you know cognitive behavioral treatment. Well, that's the treatment of choice with uh, with uh, depression. Although many people would say that, so that would be you know one kind of simple answer. So I would say you would have to have to find out what kind of trouble is a person in, and then you would have to uh, talk with the person about what kind of help the person would think that he or she needs, and then you would have to find out. It's in one way. Being there with someone is, the, is, you know, the important thing of uh, treating the majority of what today is called depression. So, so I would agree, and also go back to something Professor Eklund said earlier that um, uh, it's not about treating depression as a thing. Depression isn't a thing in its own right. There are people who have depression or who are depressed, and and depression is a is a human emotion, it's a human response to the world. So ev everyone who is depressed will be depressed for different reasons, in different circumstances, and in different ways. So it's about, if you, and, and as Magnus points out, it is self-limiting. People don't, very rarely anyway, stay depressed for a long time. It's a response to something, to some set of events. So. So from my point of view, what's important if you're trying to help someone with depression is to identify what particular set of events are, have precipitated and are sustaining their, their depression and to try and sort them out. And that, that's going to be different for each different person. And for some people, having some therapy of some sort might help them to identify that or to identify you know, better coping mechanisms for coping with with. Um, some stresses that they're under, but for other people, it will be, you know, addressing other other roots, other other uh, things that have precipitated their their emotions. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think um, the concept of alcoholism is relevant here to to what you say. I, I worked in that field for many years, and I had people coming to me saying, "I'm an alcoholic. Please treat me," and my response would be. Well, what, what is your alcoholism like? How, what is your life situation? What do you use alcohol for, etc.? And then we could start talking. People telling me that they were alcoholic didn't really give any meaning. <laughs> okay, we have uh, one more question here about the Ritalin. Um, how is it possible to give this drug to people particularly to young people, because when the effect fades, you get uh, withdrawal symptoms, and they will be interpreted as if you have ADHD or something like that. And then you need to take more medicine. How about that? So yeah, Ritalin, so mm. a question about yeah. Ritalin and ADHD, another one. Um, so, so I said earlier that Ritalin and stimulants generally can be shown in animals and in volunteers to help people quieten down and focus in the short term. But I'm glad I've had an opportunity to say that um, that long-term studies don't suggest that that translates into any benefits in terms of um, in terms of sort of higher school performance or achievement or you know any advantages in terms of of life attainment. Um, so. So uh, quite possibly the effects wear off or, or maybe the attention you get under the influence of stimulants isn't, isn't quite the attention that you need. Um, uh, there are various possibilities. Uh, and what was the question was about? Um, does anyone want to identify themselves as the questioner? <laughs> the, the question was also about, wasn't it, about whether, um, whether, whether children get withdrawal effects so yes, they do, don't they? The the, um, the effects of Ritalin are quite short acting, so uh, so that the child will become calmer, and then as the effects of Ritalin wear off, they'll they'll become hyperactive again, which may be interpreted as uh, um, you know as increasing severity and need, needing higher doses. Mm. Um, and and the and one of the most interesting long term studies which compared. Ritalin and cognitive behavioural therapy, and uh, was was reported as showing benefits of stimulants, 
um, can equally be interpreted as showing that actually the cognitive behavioural therapy was as effective in helping children to, to manage um, symptoms and more effective probably in the long term. If you wanted to yeah, add anything. Yeah. I think... Um, I think, I think thinking about giving medication to children really highlights the symbolic issues around medication. Um, so I really worry that if a child learns that, ch that, be that al adults don't like the way it's behaving and it needs to take a drug to please people, that that might be, you know, that that's not a good life lesson to be teaching children and might translate into, you know, into sort of more maladaptive coping mechanisms as, as children get older. Yes, thank you. And um, I think uh, we are getting closer to winding up for today. Uh, people are getting a little tired and uh, it has been some intensive hours, so I would like to thank you very much, all of you, to Johan, Magnus, and Joanne, in particular, coming all the way from England. And thank you all for attending tonight. Thank you.